-hmm. Can you hear me? I'm, is is this can't. mic on or not? It is on. Okay. Yep. I guess I can't hear me. We're going to uh, have a study session just for purposes of planning so that we can be done by 3.50 to give us a chance for an orderly transition to the next meeting and save space for the public to comment at least 10, 12 minutes so then we could plan to have the presentation, our questions and comments wrapped up by 3.30, 3.35 to give the public 10, 15 minutes at the end. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay. Now we'll turn this over to the city manager. Yeah, I'll, I'll quick it off, quick, kick it off quickly and try not to steal Lauren's uh, thunder here, but as uh, I'm sure you as the governing body know, we've had a comprehensive plan for a long time that identified growth corridors and future land use areas. We had an updated housing study that we did. We've had some very significant economic development successes in the last um, 24 months or so that have announced expansions that create a heightened need for housing. That's sparked a conversation. We've spent quite a bit of time and energy trying to get the word out, see if we can get some interest in, in terms of additional developments and developers. We've worked with the Lieutenant Governor and Governor's Office. Uh, that's resulted in interest uh, from a number of different um, developers and, and uh, project types. And so today is kind of a culmination of a lot of effort, uh, particularly on Lauren Driscoll's part, working with all those interested parties and trying to put together uh, kind of the, a broader vision of what, ha what we might be able to do or what the housing might look like for Salina. Um, and then kind of boiling that all down to four key projects or, or uh, big items. So with that, Lauren is sitting at the computer. There's a lot of data and a lot of information to be presented and probably just be a little bit more seamless if she can make the presentation and run the, the graphics at the same time. So with that, I'll turn it over to Community Development Director Lauren Driscoll. Do we have any of this printed out? No. <laughs> um, you know, this is a true study session today. This is really kind of letting you guys know where we're at and, and what we've got kind of on the go. Um, following this presentation, I can happily uh, send this over to the city manager's office. We can email this out. Um, and of course, it would become part of public record. But this is really like literally, this changes almost every minute right now in our world. We have a lot of uh, different people looking at us for housing. As you're aware, we went and talked to the SPARC committee. Um, a couple of different attempts at kind of engaging those conversations most recently in, uh, was it January, December, uh, went and talked with, with them and testified onto our needs, but specifically about housing. Before I get into those four key projects that Mike talked about, I want to just give you a little snapshot of really what we have on the go. And um, we've put this together over the past for uh, different taxing entities, whether it's the school district, or the county, or sometimes just ourselves to kind of understand where we've got everybody at. And when we talk about housing as a whole, we're talking not only about, you know, rentals and new projects, but some of those things are happening in the market just normally, right? Subdivisions that are moving forward with next phases. Um, Delray Mobile Home Park was recently cleared out in the last year, and they are starting to move new units in there, put in additional water, um, better connections through there, new road to connect, uh, fence, all those things. So this just kind of encapsulates where those units are starting to show up. So as I mentioned, Delray Mobile Home Park, Wheatland Valley Phase 1. Some of these you have seen through special assessments. But Cedarhurst is the IRB recently did for the senior housing. We have Ryan Edition, which is the RHID MIH. Uh, new owner-occupied property that we did this last year, Cedar Ridge Phase 2, Magnolia Hills Phase 2, Stone Lake Phase 3, and then Cedar Point Subdivision. Now, what's currently in the works? These are either people who have kind of gone beyond that interested level, but there's things that are, are out there. Either they're currently working through the incentive process or you know, maybe they're addressing infrastructure issues. There's something that's still kind of in the project negotiation phase. We're gonna talk a lot about Dreaver today um, and where we're at with that project. We're gonna talk a little bit about Flaherty and Collins. It's a developer introduced to us by Commerce who um, was asked to look at uh, three or four different communities where new developments were needed in order to meet 
incoming employees. So Commerce highlighted Salina as one of those places. Perry Reed had previously tried for that Magnolia property uh, over by Menards, but due to that deed restriction by Menards, they weren't able to go through with that. Uh, they are still interested in, in finding a property, just needs to be the right property for them in Salina. Um, project price points and, and size would be about the same, but they're looking for that. And as a developer who already has units in Salina, it's always advantageous for them to build off of those units. Um, Aero Plains subdivision, you're gonna be seeing an RHID application for them soon. And that's a property off of Centennial. And it's kind of to the, be like south west of uh, what we've been, t what we'll be talking about for the Dreaver project. And those are townhomes, and that's gonna be an RHID project. They're hoping to start construction in late summer, early fall. So that would be another good addition of, you know, I think their current numbers, this says 228 lots, but they're townhomes, so they'll have even more units. It's up in the low 300s. So it's a good number of um, units there too, and those will be owner occupied. Holmes Road, I gave its own row because I have a variety of folks that are interested in doing projects up there and we're actually gonna talk about that as one of the four projects today too. If you take the three miles of Holmes Road from Country Club down to Magnolia, that is some of our prime growth corridor. And actually, if we were to put curb and gutter, water and sewer, we open over 1,200 acres of developable land there. So, and that's one of the challenges with that section of road is that's where some of our subdivisions are going, but by the time they hit the road, we start looking at benefit districts and some of these other challenges we'll talk about. But Holmes Road has a variety of properties that folks have been looking at and could be a very good place for us to see further residential growth. And then the Community Housing Development Corporation or the CHODO is also still interested in doing a demonstration project. In fact, uh, a group of them were in Lawrence this last uh, Friday looking at how Lawrence has been doing some affordable housing and how the CHODO is involved with that. So working through a project. You know, they're a little farther off. We're probably, you know, 2023, 2024, um, but that's also something else that could become part of our future housing. And just as a reminder too, our housing plan really looks at a full 10 years. So we have those two stop points of, you know, what do we need by 2025 and what do we need by 2030? So let's talk about these four projects that we're focused on right now. So I'm gonna start with the Dreaver project. We were asked, as we're looking towards this Sparks process, the applications are due on 216. And that is the process in which a significant chunk of that ARPA money is being committed by the state to address these kind of transformational projects. And when you look at what makes something transformational, the Dreaver project has really kind of evolved into something that has that level of impact. So what we've been putting together is in addition to our applications is just kind of a condensed, what we call like a leaf packet of just a quick snapshot and a few pages of what does the project look like. We have some good language that kind of goes over, you know, whether you're one of our community partners talking to somebody in Topeka, or you're looking for support material that goes with our application. It just gives you a little bit of background about the new jobs we've been creating, why Salina needs housing, those types of things. So just that background component. We also have in here is our 10-year housing program, talking about where we need those units, what price points, and what timeline we need those units. In addition to our unit count, our housing plant also identifies these critical goals and really being able to meet that immediate demand around rental housing in those first five years is one of those critical pieces in addition to infrastructure that supports those things and you know, really pinpointing that some level of support is gonna be essential to get these units built. I think this is really interesting. So over the last five years, residential construction has been 41 units a year on average. Between 2022 and 2025, we need to be building 346 units a year. That's eight times more than we've done. 
And if we hadn't already started to see our residential numbers tick up in 2021, we would have, that average would be much lower. So we are definitely having to pick up the pace to address these needs. You guys have been introduced to Dreaver before. A uh, large multifamily developer has worked all over the country, been doing this for about 50 years. There are two sites now for the Dreaver project. The first one is one that might be new to you. They purchased two pieces of property that come around Menards um, as part of the Marietta auction. And then they're currently looking to purchase this Magnolia, what was Magnolia Point that uh, has the deed restriction on it. Um, all in all, if you take these together, you're looking at 1,300 new units this includes 950 multifamily units, 150 cottages, and 200 active adult 55 and older apartments. The 55 and older adult apartments um, have some flexibility. If we find that we don't need them throughout build out, that could always be changed to garden style apartments. But the idea between, behind those is that may free up owner occupied homes currently where somebody's like, look, I don't wanna live in this house anymore. It's more than I wanna manage. I wouldn't mind something smaller or something in a, in a managed community. So that could open up homes for purchase and kind of get the housing ladder moving a little bit. There is a YMCA facility that's part of this project. Um, one of the Dreaver goals has, had, has been to have childcare involved in their developments. And uh, the Y has identified that they're in discussion regarding this project and looking at a 60 child, 60 child child care facility as part of the Y there, um, creating a, a community anchor and child care component to this new neighborhood. Of course, there are gonna be all kinds of amenities and we'll talk about that on the next slide. The second property is over on West Crawford. It is this Western Sislin building property right here, value in and the ambassador. Uh, try as everyone may, the ambassador is not savable. <laughs> um, between break-ins, uh, mold, engineering and architectural challenges, there's so much open space. You know, that whole holodome feel, you know, you don't think about it until somebody says, well, how do you pay to heat and cool all that space? You know, how does that become valuable as a tenant? Um, and looked at a variety of things, but at the end of the day, uh, if this project uh, does happen, that building would be demolished. And all in all, these three properties are united and they become 500 new residents. The value in would stay and those are uh, that traditional hotel conversion model that Dreaver originally came to Salina to talk about, creating micro studios and they've identified those for uh, college students and service workers. Uh, specifically when kind of talking about this project over the last year or so, the universities identified that they may have seniors or married students who'd like to live off campus and this could be a good option for them. Uh, this definitely is kind of a more urbanized property and where the, the other one over by Magnolia and Menards is more of kind of that family centric neighborhood creation. And this would also have a series of amenities you'll hear, see here in a second. So this is the Menards property. And basically, you've, which we are calling Penlay Gardens. This is the 55 and older community here. These are the cottages. And then these are pretty much the largest cluster of the garden style apartments with the Y down here and more garden style apartments here. Ideally, Dreaver would like to start here with garden style apartments just kind of working through things with Menards. But if they can't kind of come to some kind of reason, then what you'll see is the project start down here and work its way up. And then ideally to get through commercial may be added, you know, residential neighborhood amenities type things, dry cleaner, coffee shops, things like that, because that's been Menards uh, hang up. But that is all negotiable between the developer, Menards and, um, the current property owner. There is a little pad up here for some commercial neighborhood development as well. 
As you'll see, and maybe it's kind of hard from this, there's a lot of paths, walkability, and connection throughout the project. There'll be community gardens, pools, barbecue space. Um, there's some sports fields down here by the Y, allowing for you know maybe some soccer leagues and things like that. So you'd actually have, again, that community connection. You're coming new to Salina. You've never been here before. It's more than just a job. It's more than just a house. It's a place to raise a family, right? You can have access to these amenities. You can get your kids, they could walk to soccer league. Um, and then you can meet different people in the community. This Y would of course be open to the whole community. So if you're a Y member, you'd have access. Um, let's see, let's scroll down to West Crawford. So this is Penlay Commons. And you'll see the ambassador is gone. A pool, a barbecue, and amenities here. Both properties would have dog parks as well. That's a huge part of apartment and rental living. Tentatively right now, there's a commercial pad here for like a coffee shop or something that would provide con convenience to the folks here. The value in is still right here and that's those um, micro units. This property is mainly made up of micro studios and junior ones. And a junior one is a larger studio with kind of a half wall for a bedroom area. These are definitely well priced. They're meant for, you know, singles or young couples or people who are just looking for a more kind of streamlined urban lifestyle, but access to a lot of amenities, shared space, you know, cool coffee hangout areas. The student area, Dreaver identified if they needed study space, things like that. Those could be worked into the project. Um, let's see. So, as we talked about, some of the things that make this project more than just housing is trying to deal with some of this blight. You can see these are project pictures from inside the Ambassador. Currently it is fully boarded up for the moment until somebody takes another board down and then we send somebody back out there to deal with it. Um, but it has progressively gotten worse. I will highlight, and this is important when we talk about Spark, is uh, the Penley Commons project is in an LMI census track, so that's low to moderate income track, which is helpful for funding, that's track five. And because these properties are not existing homes, apartments, no one's necessarily being displaced to create these projects, which is also important in the SPARK process. So the childcare piece, we talked a little bit about the YMCA being um, an active partner in this project and looking at how not only the wellness side, but really childcare for 60 kids, and that includes the outdoor space, could be built into this project, getting our community not only 60 more spots for these incoming families. As we get into the finances of how the project is built, there is something called preferred equity. So that basically says local businesses, community folks, um, and sometimes even nonprofits that want to do some impact investing are able to invest in this project. And Drevers looked at a way of taking that impact investment and for every million that's invested, you get a 3% interest rate for 10 years. So you get that money paid back, but you can choose to take 1% of the 3% and put it into a nonprofit fund that would help manage uh, basically a housing subsidy for childcare workers and paras. When we talked to the school district, it wasn't as much teachers, but really paras who are in that 11 to $12 an hour range. And when we talk about livable wage, trying to get up to 13, 14, and 15 is where we wanna be at. Many of you have sat through the discussions on childcare and heard our challenges between, you know, what a parent can pay and what we can afford to pay a childcare worker is where we start to get that rub. And this would, allow those monies to be put back to those. Um, and with the, that 1% being donated to that nonprofit, then those businesses or leaders are able to write that off. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that is an interesting kind of social component to the project that could get to something that we've had a challenge with for some time. So all in all, the housing mix breaks down to 1,800 units total. As you'll see at the Crawford property, like I mentioned, these are mainly studios and junior ones. And then the Magnolia property, which is over by Menards, 
we're doing micro studios, junior ones, you've got one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms, and then 150 cottages. In the senior active adult, it breaks down basically the same way, but not going into three bedrooms. Surprisingly enough, three bedrooms are not very popular in the rental world, and they're hard to manage. Most family sizes are not that large, or if you are looking for something bigger, you're usually trying to rent a whole house, not something like this. And so what happens from a landlord's perspective is you have two or three people renting, and if one person walks away from the lease, then that unit doesn't stay rented well. So it doesn't matter what landlord or what uh, property manager we've talked to over the last year or so, no one's a huge fan of three bedrooms. These numbers too, um, have been created, these, these unit counts, really about what we, we have reached out to the employers and asked them, how many future employees do you think you're having? What are their anticipated incomes? And do you have, like on an average from your existing insurance information, how many singles, and we're not getting any names or anything, just generic numbers, you know, how many singles do you have? How many married couples do you have or partnered? How many families do you have? Just to try and make sure that these unit counts are on a ratio that makes sense, plus that the rents um, also meet those, and the rents also match up with um, working through our housing plan. So as we, the next slide starts to get into the finances. So target rents are, are based off the total project cost, but they also do assume property tax abatement. So that's not paying any property tax for 10 years, 100% of that. And that is a huge part of definitely what has helped to get the rental rates down to this point. Um, you can see without any type of subsidy, uh, these rents are much, much higher. So all in all, we have bundled the whole project together. That includes Crawford, Magnolia, and the YMCA is kind of part of this overall project to ask. Um, you can see the acquisition cost breakdown, hard costs, soft costs, development fee, amenities, financing costs, of course, the contingency, and where the Y plays into all of that. So overall, total project cost is $315 million. That's 1,800 units, $315 million. That per unit cost is $175,000. So how do you pay for a $315 million project? And where does this all come together? So as I mentioned, 315, 175,000 a unit. So the developer is asking for additional support in addition to property tax abatement of sales tax relief in the form of an IRB, which is estimated at $10 million, and then integrated construction or permanent mortgage, and this has to do with addressing interest rates. A lot of times in a large project like this, in the construction part of a loan has a very, very high interest rate, and then you go into a mortgage after that. They're hoping for some kind of guarantee from the state or working with local banks to get a more stabilized interest rate that would bring down that overall project cost. Um, that ideally, if working out, I think their goal was 4%, it could be a $15 million save. That next piece is the net state, county, city support. Primarily, it's our big state ask of trying to figure out where kind of that true missing gap of cash comes from. And if it's right now 50 million, if we achieve somehow that 15 million working the interest rate side of that. If not, it's really 65 million. I think Mike has identified in looking at some of the monies we've set aside in our ARPA dollars for housing, we have two million. I think one was infill and one was other types of development. The county has also indicated that they've got money in their ARPA buckets set aside for housing. I think tentatively for going through this exercise we've said, okay, the county could give one million, the city could give one million. So if we take either the 50 or the 65 and take two off of that, that's really what we need to get from the state. 
that subsidy basically is 20, almost $28,000 a unit. That's basically where that big gap is at. Other things that have been looked at to make the project work is the private side of the capital structure. So first mortgage, of course, and then preferred equity. So anytime you have an investor in a project like this, the private investor, which is right below this, is at 8% or 20 million. And that 8% could go higher. We could take that to 10 or 12%. The only thing is the interest rate private investors are gonna demand is going to be higher, which makes the project not as, it, it, for instance, we can't keep rent rates as low as they are. So in trying to kind of balance all of this out, this leans heavier on preferred equity than on private investment. And the preferred equity is what I talked about earlier. For every million that's invested, you'll get 3% rate of return for 10 years. And this is an opportunity and I think Drever has already started these conversations of looking to the major employers who have these employees showing up saying, look, we can get this stuff built in a timely manner. And oh, by the way, uh, Drever is currently working with Hutton, local contractor to do design build on this project. Um, that's where those master plans came from. The idea is to do uh, not to exceed uh, construction bid here and really that, that combination of trying to get that investment from the local employers and having somebody boots on the ground who knows Kansas and knows Kansas construction, the goal is to get all 1,800 units built in less than three years. Some ambitious people on the Drever team, particularly Steve McCoy, head of construction, thinks they might be able to do it in two. So that is a lot faster than anybody else we've been talking to. So that meets your housing policy's objective of all projects being completed within three years. That definitely meets our housing policy objective of getting a significant amount of units by 2025. Uh, the preferred equity right now is set at 25%, so that's trying to uh, build that preferred equity at 60 million. The private investor side I mentioned is 20 million and then the development team or Drever themselves is four million in this project. So what is the ask on something like this? And this is why, <laughs> Commissioner Ryan, I haven't printed anything yet because I am distilling this message down like hourly as other people give us feedback and comments. I met with the Y last week. Um, we've met you know, with our local representatives to get their feedback. Uh, we've met with the universities to get their feedback. So everybody's kind of giving feedback. So I'm constantly been going through that the last few days. But all in all, to try and make this Drever project work, which I'll just kind of remind you, we have 1,800 units, which meets our most immediate demand. In fact, I kind of joke, like it gets our head above water and we might even start swimming towards shore. <laughs> like It would be a significant impact on our need. And really keep the door open for further economic development activities. Because right now, I don't know how you bring anything else here because we don't even have enough to meet our current demand, but we don't want to stop all the good, the good activity we have going on. So we get units, we get units at different price points, and we get different product types. When we talk to employers, Eric Brown and I did that, did that walk. We have talked to them, and what they told us is, I got managers coming, I got line workers coming, I got executives coming, I got people who are gonna be here a little bit, couple years, make all that work, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and that's hard, most, most developers have a thing, a product they do, and they could do it here or they could not. Drever has been very open to asking, what does Salina need, how do we make it work? So we need cash for filling that gap and that includes $75 million of financial support. That, as a reminder, includes the sales tax, lowering interest, and then that cash infusion. Replacing expensive private equity with preferred stakeholder is critical to just being able to make this work. It also gives some local control to community leaders, employers, 
um, and nonprofits who are interested in investing to make sure this happens fast and it happens at the price point and the quality that we want. I talked about that interest rate. We have started to have that conversation with commerce and seeing if that's something Kansas has ever done, guaranteeing loans like this, sales tax exemption, property tax exemption, and then the YMCA. Uh, Hutton has also built several YMCAs around Kansas, so we're very familiar what this looks like. So estimates are right now at uh, 10 million, that's 30,000 square feet new facility. Okay, I'm gonna take a deep breath <laughs> before we launch into the other ones. Anybody have any Dreaver questions? And I guess I, I should say before I say that, <laughs> this ask, we are trying to figure out how to package it. Does it all go to Spark? Does it go to some of the infrastructure grants, things like that, and that's, that's really what we're working on between now and the 16th on how to package that. And we're working on filling the application out. Mike, do you have anything you wanna add to? Well, I was actually thinking where would be the appropriate time to kind of talk about that spark process a little bit because there was a 16th date and a 28th uh, date. But why don't we get through these and then we'll double back to spark. Okay, any questions, Commissioner uh, Hopp? <coughs> Or any specific to the driver? Yeah, I'll, I'll wait to hear all. And, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I just have two. On the top. Any uh, plans? F would you envision any need for child care in the West Crawford project? It is a. It is. It, it could be done. The way Driver looked at it was with a lot of the studios and the junior ones, the likelihood of those being more family oriented was less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you demo the ambassador, you got rid of a lot of that common space. But if either a partner like the Y or somebody wanted to step up and say, hey, you know, we could use X amount of square footage, you know, I'm sure that's something we can get creative on. We'd lose unit counts because we'd have to find space for that, but maybe where the that commercial pad is could be used for childcare. So I don't think it's completely off the table, but how you fund that is not currently in this ask. Okay, and this is probably a little detail, but uh, how soon do you bring commercial th things like a food supply west of I-135? Because if a lot of kids in that area, I still just don't see a safe way to send them walking over to Dillon's on the other side of that interstate. Well, I'm, I'm gonna try and find a good way. <laughs> so I wanna, I wanna fund Magnolia for a mile there. And we're gonna put a, a big old wide bike ped trail so that hopefully we can get people from Centennial over to the other side. I think Drever is very interested in a mix of some neighborhood commercial in there and that could be a small grocery or, or neighborhood convenience store. The problem is it's kind of a chicken or egg. Well, maybe not really. You gotta have rooftops to justify commercial. And so if, the f if they start with that property in front of the hotel on Magnolia, you're not gonna have enough rooftops yet to justify commercial over there. So that may end up being that pad that's kind of behind the bank. Mm -hmm. But both properties, West Crawford and Magnolia, identify you know at least one pad or area for commercial. And, and I guess I would add the specifics of what commercial activity occurs is really kind of out of our hands. It'll it'll depend on that market. It'll depend on the property, and we just kind of have to see how the future plays out. Right. And USD three if I can handle all these kids and get them to school. That is what Superintendent Exline said. Okay. So I I have spoken to her about these projects, and we talked a little bit about kind of other growth areas. We have some cluster mapping that we've done and we'll talk about in some of these other projects that identify if growth is gonna happen, here's where it's at. And basically school district has said, enrollment is down, we need families and we need kids. And they are prepared to kind of address how boundaries and things like that work um, as those new families arrive. Okay, very good, thank you. I guess, I guess I yeah. do have mm -hmm. This is a fairly large ask, obviously, based on what the city and the county can, can <laughs> come to the table with, it's fairly minimal. Um, so has the developer stated if they are only 
to receive X number of dollars in, in, in uh, incentives, will they do the Crawford property or will they do the Menards property first? If they cannot do both at the same time. Well, the projects are, we do have two separate we can look at them separately. They can be pulled apart. And that's something that we've been talking a lot about in the last few days of trying to understand, you know, going forward for Spark or just infrastructure. Every project has to be, has to be disassembled and built back up however it needs to get to the money that we need. I, do they have a preference? I don't know if, if it's one or the other, but they can be broken apart if we can only get funding for one or the other. And we expect we're going to be at, uh, there, there's going to be a desire that we prioritize and we're going to have to be strategic about that. Part of the conversations we're having with our representatives are what probably has the highest likelihood of success. And so we'll need to kind of facilitate that. And I guess one of my other questions, I'm going to maybe look at Commissioner Linkowitz and maybe if uh, uh, Mr. Welch is in the audience. Um, we talked about 400 micro units and I'm not, you know, that's, that a, is that a number that's too large for our market, or is that, you know, we really don't have, I guess I call them micro units in Salina right now. To me, are those more transitional units, or are those actually units that are viable over a long term? I do occasionally get the call for a studio, it's kind of more how it's phrased, but it's basically the same thing. Um, I mean, just based on my experience with the the call load I get, most of my inquiries are for one bedroom units. What we've found, and it's not just with Dreaver, it's working with other developers, looking at how they build their product counts. What they will tell you is studios, junior ones and ones are your, your best and easiest units to fill. Um, whether they're temporary and transitionary, but there are a lot of people that if Multifamily these days when you build developments like this are not apartment buildings anymore. They are a lifestyle. They come with pools, they come with shared space, you know, fitness facilities, all these things. So if you don't like your little footprint, there are other places to go and kind of live your full life. And it is not cheap and easy to have that one or two bedrooms anymore. And in order to make this stuff affordable, you know, these studios are the most common, and we definitely, as staff, asked that question. And when we took to talk to developers out of Kansas City, you know, they were saying that's typically how they build their stack. They're the units that fill the fastest, and they're the units that stay full the longest. I don't want to be one of those because we've never done it. You turn your mic on. I, I, I think price point oh, certainly is a factor now. in terms of uh, trying to identify the product line. I personally like the fact that it's going to take care of some of the blight on West Crawford. And we've talked about the gateway corridor in the past, and mm -hmm. it'd be a nice way to correct that. I think so that might help us strategically as well <laughs> in terms of our applications. While we're talking about Drever, we might as well talk about Magnolia Road because it's a, it's a project that many of us have been talking about for a few years and it's a, an identified need and it now has a housing component to it because we're gonna have all these units over there plus the aeroplane subdivision if that RHID goes forward is also in that vicinity and could potentially use Magnolia Road. And K-State is getting ready to update its campus, adding more student housing, additional buildings. Magnolia Road will only continue to get busier right there. So a second project that we put together is addressing the one mile section of Magnolia that's coming from the highway all the way to Centennial. So with the new housing that we're talking about between aeroplanes and Drever, we're looking at an additional 12,340 trips a day. So it's gonna be a little bit of traffic, that's average daily trips per day. Um, you've got K-State right there. Centennial just basically goes right into it. And we are lacking a number of things. We're just two lanes, no curb and gutter, no shoulder, some very steep ditches. You've got the rail crossing and a variety of other challenges along there. 
This is a high road or high usage road, not only for passenger vehicles, but also semi trucks dealing with getting to the airport and other industrial folks we have along this way. Not only is it K-State that's affected, but Salina Tech. Um, and then we also have a variety of major employers along Centennial with their employees using Magnolia. So this tiny, tiny, tiny print <laughs> basically breaks down to $10.5 million. <laughs> and that is a recent high level um, estimate we got from out of house on upgrading that 4,200 feet of three lane road with medians and turn lanes, 10 foot hike bike trail on the south side and then five foot sidewalk north side and then street lighting, landscaping, public art, bridge and culvert replacement, uh, channel realignment and of course dealing with the railroad crossing, widening and improvements that way. So that ask kind of goes right hand in hand with that driver property and a variety of other economic activities that are happening in the community. So we're looking at different kind of pools of money on how to pitch this project. And that would be paid, done all at once or there might be some phasing to the different components of that? I think we're hoping to get this one mile done all at once. All at once. Yep. And I feel that uh, I drive that quite a bit, and it's awful. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think really need to get the road before the houses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would there be KDOT funding available for that? That's, that's <laughs> we are having those conversations. Okay. <laughs> and the funding may need to come some from KDOT. You know, it may, some may come through some of these other infrastructure grants that have gotten dropped right now. I think we're trying to figure out how to, how to package it, but you know, we've done that preliminary of getting those numbers so we know what our ask is and kind of refining that down. That's kind of the name of the game right now is being shovel ready and being able to put that information into whatever application they're seeking for these different funding sources. And, and those funding sources are coming out with very little lead time and, and high expectations of detail. So we're trying to identify our key uh, priorities and, and be prepared. Our other road project that has to do with housing is actually Holmes Road. We're trying to connect, well, let me tell you a little bit about how infrastructure and housing come together. So this is one of our cluster maps. This is out of the housing plan. And what you can see is we did an exercise here of finding large vacant parcels. I think these are 25 acres and larger um, that are near infrastructure, like within half a mile, but don't necessarily have it and could potentially be developed for residential. There were some other um, kind of minor characteristics we looked at, but basically what it boils down to is these clusters show you where we can develop future housing. And if you can't see it, it's pretty red. That section along Homes really has one of our most significant clusters for future residential development, not to mention it's where our comprehensive plan does identify our future residential growth is out east. Addressing infrastructure, particularly at Homes Road, has just as much to do with being development ready. So when a developer shows up and says, hey, I'm looking for a parcel, well, they might find the parcel, but then what, right? The, the road's gotta be upgraded, um, they've gotta get water and sewer to it. All of those pieces are time, effort, that a lot of them, especially if they're from out of town, maybe don't wanna deal with. And so stuff needs to be development ready. When they're here, it's just ready to go. The other thing is a cost issue. If you take our special assessment process, which is pretty normal in Kansas, you're still looking at thirty to $40,000 on the price of a home over those 15 years. If we then have to add a benefit district for large scale road improvements like we're talking about here, we could easily be adding 10 to $15,000 on top of those specials. So we take affordable workforce homes, you know, let's say $250,000, well they're now over $300,000 just by the time all this comes together. So without infrastructure, we're also starting to create a very um, unaffordable environment for housing in this corridor that we desperately need. When, when we discuss Holmes Road, I know you mentioned earlier about curb and gutter. Would Holmes Road have to be curbs and gutter? So this is interim standard with curb and gutter. When we looked at the difference in asking, 
we have a secondary number that doesn't add curb and gutter. It just brings us up to interim standard. But if we're going to go ask for money right now, well, that's okay. If we we, we were, were going to go for curb receive, and gutter letter, if, I guess that's my next deal. If we didn't receive funding to help us get to that, would we be able to not go ahead and do the full curb and gutter? Correct. We could just go to interim standard. I think the other thing of why this project's in our top four is not only does it create a lot of development ready residential area, <coughs> but it's also not easy to fund just any old way. This is a truly residential road. It has really no link to commerce. There's no commercial, major commercial activity here. There's no you know, airport or rail station or anything like that. So when you typically look at state and federal dollars, that's your big link, right? And we just don't have it on this road. But when you talk about economic development right now for us, if we don't have the housing, you don't have the economic development. So this infrastructure is critical. 1,264 acres of land would be ready to build. Whether you want to do it or not is up to individual property owners, but in the Crawford uh, intersection alone, you've got 783 acres, and I can tell you out of that um, identified kind of pull out there, three out of the four properties identified there are ready to develop or are interested in developing. And, and if I could add, part one of the timing challenges that we've faced in the past is a developer can focus on the improvements within their subdivision on their own property, but these type of improvements really require critical mass of multiple property owners all at the same time. We, we had an interested developer on one side of Holmes, but when you looked at what was needed, Holmes itself had to be improved, and that didn't 100% benefit that property owner. Water was to the west and sewer was to the east, and so you quickly needed multiple property owners all to be on the same page and the same timeline. Getting, getting a backbone in place kind of makes in those individual sites development ready and hopefully accelerates that development. So you are saying the majority of the <laughs> property owners are ready to sell? Well, I, I wouldn't say the majority, but one of the key intersections, which is Crawford and Holmes, has three or has one really large parcel, 117 acres, that some local folks have definitely been looking at and doing housing there. There's 34 acres that has been previously interested in developing and that developer would be willing to do that again, but the benefit district involved with the road is really what's stopped them from doing that. And then the developer on the 10 acres has a development right next to that and is, and is interested in moving forward on those as well. It's really the road piece that's been holding everybody back. Um, and just like Mike said, trying to get everybody to sign on to the benefit district is a real challenge. Um, some of these other ones, there's like a 622 acre parcel. It's a quarter, it's a quarter section. Um, it's in trust. Um, but I, I think that would have some potential in the future. It, this would really probably get us 10 to 15 years of good solid housing development if we move along at the rate that we're moving. And I think it would allow it to clip along better because we're not doing this piecemeal by piecemeal that it'd be just ready to go. So there are, there are known developers interested. And then right here, if you can see on the cursor, this um, more southern portion already has subdivisions kind of right here that are developing. And they have additional phases to the back that if that perimeter road issue was taken care of, they would just keep developing from where they're already at. And this is all county property currently? The roadway itself is, is in the county. Some of those parcels, the, the, the city limits line kind of jogs in mm -hmm. as you go down that corridor currently. So road numbers, if we do take it up to curb and gutter, is 5.2 million. And then water and sewer totals out to 5.6 million. Two. Sorry. So 10.8 million is the total project ask that's getting the road up to curb and gutter with water and sewer. The other optimal piece is there is a bit of an elevation issue out there and being able to design water and sewer comprehensively from the beginning would also allow the system to be designed in a way that, you know, is really going to be the most optimal for long-term maintenance for us, which is definitely an advantage to the city and who has to take care of it in the long run. So that, 
I mean, realistically, from looking at a long-term perspective, if we could get Holmes Road and we could get Drever, I mean, we would we would be rolling. <laughs> we would have rental units and we would have land you could develop for owner-occupied housing that's pretty much ready to go. Um, last is I mentioned uh, a developer brought to us through Commerce. Uh, their name is Flaherty and Collins. They're out of Kansas City. They're also looking at doing uh, projects in Wichita, Topeka, KCK and Salina were the key areas Commerce asked them to look at and identify potential projects. So they have brought to us, um, looking at here over on Ohio, 220 units that would be gar developed garden style apartments and completed within three years with typical modern rental amenities like pool, barbecue, pet area, those types of things, shared outdoor spaces. Um, there's an example of their different rents. They've also identified too that really one bed, one bath, and they said they've, they've set this for Salina because when we looked at some of their Kansas City properties, they usually do a lot more studios but we said, you know, I think we need at least, you know, we need one beds too in this particular property, but no three bedrooms. Um, this project totals out to a little over 44 million. It is assuming IRBs, 10 years, 100%. Um, and then the request that they're making for that gap piece would be 18 million towards the project's total. So of the 44 million, 18 million would be supplied by state grant or other option. So that kind of brings us down to the ask. This is a product that we do need per the housing plan. Uh, price points are not out of whack with what the housing plan suggests are appropriate levels. It would also be an alternate project you know, Drevers pretty much got their stuff on the west side of town. This would give rentals on the east side in that Ohio area, um, which again is furthering units around the community. Um, yeah. He, he might compare the cost per unit for this with Drever. Yeah, I think this works out to if you take the 220 units and you divide that by the 18 million, it's like 81,000 a unit. So it is um, a little bit higher than the driver per unit cost, which is a little over 27,000, I think. But it's a much smaller project um, and you can, <laughs> you know, there's something about that scale of economies when dealing with multifamily and how you make that work. And there are a lot of other, um, a lot of other pieces to that Drever project using the pref equity and some of those other pieces to really make a project that size work. This is pretty much what they would have built in Kansas City kind of area. I mean, taking into some of our costs and things like that, but it really, I think that's one of the things that we're looking at too right now is our costs just aren't that greatly different than what it costs to do this stuff in Wichita and Kansas City. In fact, I've got a meeting with Marty this week from RDG and I want him to run us some fresh numbers I mean, we don't need a whole new supplement, but I want to make sure that we're keeping up because, I mean, if we take into consideration any of our economic development leads right now, these numbers are stale. And our housing plan right now identifies a need for units under 625,000 or 625 a month for rentals. That's not happening. Anything under seven, 750, you're going LIHTC or some kind of income subsidy type situation. And I think a year ago when Marty was working on these numbers with us, 625 seemed like it might be attainable if the economy, labor, materials went back to kind of post or pre-COVID numbers, but they haven't. And I don't think they're for a while. So realistically, seven, 750 is what our bottom line needs to be for market rate. And I just want Marty to kind of check that. So it's something we're staying consistent on top of. And we were very conservative in those numbers assuming I think what 60% of these people are absorbed by the county. 40% well, in the city, 60% yeah. in the region. Which I'm, 
now knowing what our neighbors are doing as far as development, they're in the same pickle we are. And I, I don't think that equation of, of absorption is, it's, it's gonna be more on us. So those are the four projects that, in a housing perspective, we are trying to find money for. So Dreaver, Holmes Road, Magnolia Road, and Flaherty and Collins Project. Did I miss anything, Mike? Um, KU, uh, K oh, K yes. So I don't have full leave materials built for this yet, but um, KU. I, I started that misnomer, Kansas Wesleyan. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> KWU. <laughs> So, as many of you are aware, Kansas State, I'm gonna get this right now, K-State Salina Aerospace and Technology Campus, it's actually their new full title, is, has already been looking at building dorms and, and moving through with that process. They have, their first phase is a more traditional dorm complex, and then their second piece is kind of a dorms, but they're more apartments and shared space like that. If they were able to get some funding, K State Manhattan already kind of has an ask, but their ask to Salina and the county was to look to see if any funding became available, if we could co-partner on you know applications and things like that, because it could get their things built faster, particularly phase two at K State. And each unit that they build potentially gets somebody out of existing housing that's in the city, whether they're renting a house or a unit somewhere. So the more kids we bring back onto campus, I should call them students, the more students we bring back onto campus, the more units we start to free up in town. So that is a significant impact on our units. I think many of us are wondering the impact it's gonna have on owner-occupied housing because several parents, both from Kansas Wesleyan and K-State, we know have purchased homes, more than several, a lot, have purchased homes because coming from other communities, it was reasonable. And they've bought those as investment pieces and they're either gonna go back to renting them or they might go back to the market. So there's that impact. And then Kansas Wesleyan is looking at doing a series of tiny homes. They have several homes that they own near their campus that they're looking to demo and then kind of creating this really cool walkable um, community that would have all these little tiny homes. I think you can get four or five students per home. And that ask, I can actually remember off the top of my head, is five million? Five million. That would help them to speed that up and again, get students back onto that campus out of, ex out of existing rental stock we have in the community or even freeing up some possible owner-occupied units. Can you remember the total at K-State? I wanna say it's like 300 and something. How many units they had? Yeah, it's like 300 units that they're creating at K-State. So again, pulling those out of our, our known housing stock and moving them back onto campus. So both of those would make a big impact. We've had that conversation um, primarily Friday and Saturday with the universities. They're sending over graphics and numbers and things like that. And we're kind of prepping that and building that all together to see where that fits into funding components too. It's a really big strategy, but we have a really big problem. So it does take kind of all these pieces playing together. Okay, now did I miss anything, Mike? <laughs> I, I think that's a pretty good summary. I, the, you know, we've tried to put together a vision that is responsive to what we see going on in the community in terms of economic development and need, as well as responsive to what interest we've been able to garner from developers um, in the community and outside the community recognizing it is a big vision, it is a big number, it is a big ask, and I don't have <laughs> those funds solely targeted out of the, the city's budget, but it's a starting point, especially in these unprecedented times with ARPA funding and infrastructure funding, and we fully recognize we, we need to be ready with this level of detail as opportunities come along. We're trying to have those conversations with uh, anyone and everyone that, that might have some influence uh, in advance and we are gonna have to prioritize um, and be prepared with that. But that's kind of distilling everything that we know about the community's needs and the activity that we have going on. These are kind of the focal points at the moment. And I think, you know, we've tried over the last, you know, week or so to have conversations with different stakeholders, different elected 
officials, different folks, you know, at state level asking, do these asks seem too much? The answer has generally not been an issue. Yeah, I mean, I there, say there was a widespread optimism that, that yeah. all this funding would come through, but it wasn't a yeah, no yes. Your orders of magnitude off. It's we got to have the conversation. You got to be ready to to participate in the process, and we'll see what we can figure out. Right. We'll just get through some questions, comments, so we can keep it moving. Commissioner Longby, what a yeah, yeah we, we can just start and work our way. Uh, I'd like to go back out to Magnolia with Menards. Has that all been cleared through? You, you talk like there was still some we, hurdles to clear there. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in at? there. I think the, the, fir the first pass of that conversation put too much emphasis on the city as if we had a role in that more than we actually do. And so there's definitely clarity about there is a deed restriction. Menards has kind of made it clear how resolute they are about that. The property owner, which is different than Dreaver and Dreaver and Menards, are going to have to work that through. So, is that process in place? Or are they? They are. They are working through that process. I mean, and what we've heard is 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 different things from from all you know all parties. But I mean, it's theirs to work out. And I, I think, Dreaver has more flexibility that they could accommodate maybe certain things where the previous developer kind of said, look, this is what we do. This is kind of what we do. And we're not adding, you know, these other things or, or. How much of that property does Menards have a say on? I only know of that one deed restriction. Right. The portion to the north that wraps around on the interstate side is the portion that is under the ownership of the developer that entered into the agreement with Menards. Everything on the west side and the south was Marietta prop yeah, property that was auctioned off without That's any out of the district. Okay. So, and I think Lauren's right. The, there's more recognition now on the part of the property owner and Dreaver that it needs to be collaborative with Menards. There's an expectation of retail development. I think they have an idea that they're trying to, you know, strike a balance in hopes of getting Menards to consent, but it's really up to them to yeah. sort that out. Uh, back out to the uh, West Crawford area I, I think that'd really be great to clean clean that up but it feels like to me like subsidized housing is that how you would term it no I subsidized housing is typically you know you're you're subsidizing it to get below average rental rates these are we're subsidizing them to market rate if you want to use the word subsidy but realistically it's 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 gap filling and incentivizing housing to be built because if we don't incentivize it and address the gap, it just doesn't get built. Okay. And there's one other property on West Crawford there behind the, the old trailer park that's supposed to be getting cleared out. Has anyone looked at, did that ever sell? Has anyone looked at developing? Yeah, are we talking about the Pace Mobile Home Park off of Broadway? Yeah. Yes, it has been sold and it is being cleaned up. Yeah, that, if we're talking about the Pace property, uh, what is that? A half mile? Yeah, it's off of Broadway. Of, the, of this location. Kind of. Yeah. So yes, that property is being looked at. It could be used for a variety of things. It's a very old parcel. And I guess my question is, like they did out at North 13th, why haven't we looked at more mobile homes for immediate need? Well, we actually are. I have another park that just submitted all new permits and is pulling in new units this week. We've got Delray on the go, and some of them are, are starting to turn over. It's a pretty particular business model. Um, you just kind of have to find somebody who wants to do that business model. And then one older park has actually recently been purchased by Salina Housing Authority and is being turned into as part of their RAD conversion project. Um, real quick, so the Housing Authority has an obligation to take old units those that get sold take those proceeds and start to build new units, more efficient units. And in one of our old mobile home parks, they're building new multifamily in one I, of those. I guess that's an idea I had, but the uh, ambassador is the mobile home park behind there to renovate that while you're at it. That's one of my least engaged owners. Okay. Yeah. Part of it, we have to take the opportunities that come forward in terms yeah. of property that's changing hands and available. In addition to mobile homes, we took a hard look at manufactured homes, had conversations with the Manufactured Home Association, and what we found is 
they're they've got a waiting list so far out in the future there just doesn't seem to be a lot of capacity there to um, put orders in and have manufactured housing fill a void go ahead Carl um, big problems and a big vision uh, generational thing to me um, where uh, do the other taxing entities around us stand I mean what's the tone of the conversation with the airport authority the USD 305 or uh, are they willing to uh, <laughs> is anybody looking at the mill levy to, to help with this sort of thing and another question is uh, um, where are we with influencers in the in the, the governmental state and federal money for that do we have a, a lobbyist or are we teaming this through on our own uh, what, what's uh, what kind of help do we need in that regard Lauren do you want to describe the conversations with the taxing entities first and then I'll yes second. so I have a slide that I'm working on and it's that's the one that I'm trying to kind of figure out. Typically on an IRB, when we do property tax abatement, we do a cost benefit analysis. And in just in the last few days of kind of pulling all this together, I haven't had one done yet. So I'm actually making a call today to get one done. Kind of back the napkin, we started to make some estimates of what the property tax impact would be, but probably not at the point where I wanted to put it on a slide to say this is it. Um, I think in general it comes out to about five million dollars a year but then how that breaks out between city county and those entities but Tim Rogers has been in the conversations we've been having over the last couple of days and is aware I think um, I probably have not had a conversation with the library <laughs> <laughs> who is one of those taxing entities but we have talked with the school district you know, have talked with uh, airport authority and with the county. Phil's been a phenomenal partner in all of this, you know, asking critical questions and understanding how the county fits into this and, and where those roles balance, recognizing that, you know, the economic development that we've had happening really affects both the city and the county. Um, it's kind of been known from the beginning, particularly with the Dreaver project, that, you know, property taxes were going to be a part of that conversation as well as sales tax and that traditional IRB situation. The one that's been the biggest ask is, you know, what is that gap? What is that cash ask? Knowing that that was gonna have to be something out there. What? And I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, and, and I think Mike's probably the right person to speak to, you know, who we've been talking with, but I think we have a lot of good community partners that when this is ready to go down to Topeka and goes into those different places that we're trying to find money, I think they're willing to be by our side on that. So with respect to the taxing entities, I certainly don't want to create the impression that we're speaking for any of them. We've been trying to kind of keep them inform informed as this conversation goes on. Are they concerned about property tax abatement? Totally valid, totally understandable. The difficulty becomes, you know, we're on the precipice of we need this housing to support uh, our employers. And you know, I, I, when we talk about but for, um, I think the but for aspects of property tax abatement for these projects is is pretty solid. In fact, the need goes beyond that. So well, we're going to have to work, continue to work through that process. And, and if there is objection to you know property tax abatement, um, I'm not sure if we can find a way to have these pro these projects go forward. Not saying that objecting is wrong. It's just that vital to to these models. With respect to uh, lobbying, we've not hired a lobbyist. Um, we have been in contact uh, with the assistance of, of Tim Rob Rogers, Eric Brown, Mitch Robinson. Uh, we've had ongoing conversations with state and federal elected officials. Um, been trying to identify, get a good understanding of the ARPA process, but identify other funding um, resources that are out there. So I feel like uh, we've been getting really good feedback that uh, Salina is presenting a unified um, uh, vision that shows that the community is all working together instead of these isolated, um, you know, requests and ideas. Uh, and I think the our elected officials and the people that are going to be part of that ARPA process are fully aware of where we're at, and we just have to continue to monitor the process and stay on their radar. Um, that's not to say that other communities might not be hiring, hiring a lobbyist for this purpose. Well, and I am presenting to the county tomorrow morning at their meeting, so. Yeah, more of a comment than a, than a question is, 
again, I, I'm glad I'm not in your shoes, although I guess we all are. It's, it's the timing of this. You know, we have an immediate need. We're not sure from meeting with the regulators last, uh, our, our representatives last week, they're not really sure when these dollars are going to become available. My concern is, and it's hard to believe that this could become political, but with the election coming up in, in, uh, in later this year, do we get into an infight between the governor and the and the state house about who gets credit for these dollars being used? And that's one of my concerns. And I think Mike and I have talked about that. So, so it'll Lauren's be interesting. kind of taking the lead on housing along with her uh, fellow Amanda, and Jacob's taking the lead on ARPA along with his fellow Kylie. So if we have a little bit of time, I'd, I'd like to give Jacob an opportunity to talk about ARPA. We've got eight minutes left. <laughs> Are there any anyone in the, I hate to call it audience, but uh, in the gallery <laughs> who, would, uh, who has something that still needs to be added to the conversation or a pertinent question that hasn't been asked yet or an observation? We, we may leave here with a better understanding of what you say than what ARP is about. So, <laughs> Commission Todd Welsh, uh, 221 South Morse Drive. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I've been listening to everything in here. Uh, the I don't want to call them problems, but the things that we're working on, I'm involved in quite a few of them as I was sitting here listening to them. So I'll share with you some things that I can and some things that I can of questions that you had. Uh, Commissioner Longbine, the trailer park actually closed this morning. We were in the process of uh, filing for the asbestos removal, and you will see trailers coming out there hopefully in the next 30 days cleaning up that site. Um, not sure exactly what's going to go on there yet, but potentially could at least it's cleaned up from there. So to answer your question uh, you. from that, so I was involved in that. Um, can't release who it is yet, but uh, it's public record. I'm sure if you want to check now, but I cannot uh, release who that is. Uh, Commissioner Hoppeck on micro units. I think you and I talked a couple of times on there when they were the driver group, uh, and also in full disclosure, I do represent the driver group on a couple of properties that they purchased all of the property around the Nards. I'm currently involved with them now. Uh, the micro units, uh, the thing that was best explained to me when I first heard about it when they were looking at doing the ambassador was, man, what are we going to do? Who, who's going to live in a half a hotel room? And they had a great response and said, Todd, you're thinking of what Salina looked like in the past. We're building for Salina in the future, meaning there are many people who are coming to our community who are trying to decide what to do or the, the husband comes ahead of time before the family comes and they're looking for small places to stay. Uh, there are companies in town now that have houses where six and seven employees are living together because there's no place to live. But if we had micro units, they would love to live in those micro units or one bedroom studios versus living in basements and air mattresses and things like that. But those micro units are not available uh, at this time. Um, as far as, again, the um, <clears throat> I can't go into a whole lot of detail on there, but I would tell you that it is very close on the um, the Menards consent for the apartment complex um, should happen relatively soon uh, for that. So that could, I, we hope that when that comes back in there, the support comes uh, because that uh, restriction will be removed and they will be able to get consent and that is very, very close uh, of getting that done. I also in full disclosure own land at Holmes and Crawford and wanted to just talk about that. For 10 years, I've been trying to get infrastructure and roads and things to happen up there. And um, what my biggest concern is, is that all of this development that we're talking about is putting a lot of pressure on 305 in the South District and the elementary schools and the junior highs and things like that. What would happen by putting uh, homes in play from Country Club to Magnolia would be open up all of that ground for the Central District, Meadowlark, Oakdale area for them to redo some of that line so we're not putting as much pressure out on South High. My concern is eventually you'll live on Magnolia, you'll see South High, but you'll go to Central. And so that would help open up some stuff there. So I'd have any, any questions and try and give him some time there if you have any questions on that. Nope, thank you. I'll put you on the put you on the payroll here. <laughs> 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 Norman Manuslana, 
haven't heard any discussion about water issues. We're gonna be tied up in court because these issues are being discussed in other states. I took a lot of time and trouble. I talked to people out in Western states. Water issues are being tied up in court since back in the 40s. Whose water rights are they? Senior water rights. We're running out of water. We're using up the water faster than we can replace it. So if you think you can get enough water here, these rivers, these lakes, they're drying up. You cannot build progress without water. So I would look a little harder at this because one place it's gonna cost $500 million just to build a canal. So your figures that you're quoting are way off base. But it's gonna be about water, folks. Business increases is more demand for water. As the population increases, so do our problems increase. Mm. It's water. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Wood, you got uh, two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no pressure. So I'll just talk a little bit about the, the processes we have going on right now. Obviously, ARPA uh, was passed at the federal level, and there's a lot of money that's gone around. We got some here locally. The state I got about $1.6 billion uh, that's kind of in their discretionary uh, fund that they're able to use. Uh, they've allocated $500 million of that um, to do, I think, for unemployment, um, to fill that uh, unemployment bank back up. Um, there's two processes that we're really focused on right now. Uh, one of those uh, has a submittal deadline of the, of the 16th, so that's next week. And, and basically, um, the, the uh, ARPA, they have a committee called the SPARC Committee that's uh, broken down into four subcommittees, and they're going to take, uh, right now, it's just really ideas. They're taking ideas um, about what they should do with the, the money. That The pool for those four uh, groups is $731 million that they'll, uh, they'll parse out. So um, we're going to submit and we're gonna submit the Dreaver project and say this is what our vision is for, for Salina. We're gonna submit uh, several other projects. Uh, we've been working with the county, um, you know, the chamber, uh, everybody, uh, to figure out what it is we wanna submit for that. So we'll submit some ideas for that. From that point, we think that the committees will meet and they'll take a look at those ideas and they'll say, okay, we're gonna either fund a, a project outright or we'll make a program um, that will fulfill some of those needs across the state. So um, that's that's the first process. The other process is $100 million that was set aside for more, uh, it's called the base grant, and that's more economic development. Um, and and it's it's based on economic development rather than housing or some of the other, other needs that are out there. Um, so that grant is $100 million. You can submit up to three grants per entity. So the chamber could submit three, we could submit three, the school could submit three. Um, and the, the max amount there is, is $25 million, uh, but we have to make sure that it meets uh, the needs that are set out in that section of the grant. Um, so right now we're kind of trying to decide uh, amongst us all, we've had lots of conversations about what it is that would be appropriate for the city, the county, uh, every entity to submit um, for that grant. And we're, we're doing everything we can to take advantage of every penny that's out there. Um, another thing that's happening right now at the federal level is the infrastructure grant. There's not a whole lot of information that's come out about that yet. It's, it's kind of started to trickle just in the last couple of weeks. Um, there will be money, I think, uh, for, for things like roads. I think there's some, some money that's appropriate for things like Magnolia Road. Um, Holmes Road, uh, as Lauren said, is one of those that's kind of an outlier because it's residential. I don't know that there's a lot of funding out there for that. Uh, but we're taking a look. I've got a fellow, uh, a Lead for Kansas fellow, that's uh, following all of these things. Um, and as they come out, we're going to try and just be ready to submit. So in the coming weeks, uh, there may be a time where we have to say, okay, there's a grant that just got dropped. Uh, we may have to have special meetings. We may have to have, uh, you know, some, some discussions outside of just a regular uh, Monday meeting to try and make sure that we're uh, maximizing what we're submitting on these grants. But we're trying to be as prepared as possible. Um, for everything that drops, so. And well, it wasn't too long, right? Three minutes? No, I actually, and I understood every bit of it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> One observation, while 25 million sounds like a sizable project, four of those grants statewide and that fund is gone. So the, the state has done that more than once now where they've 
uh, allocated an, a dollar amount, they've allocated a maximum project amount, but if they awarded those, it'd be four for the state. So Is that also a deadline of the 16th? Uh, that one's the 28th. 28th. And that one's, uh, you had to be a little bit more specific on what you want. I mean, there's some real parameters for that grant that you have to, the, the application is a little bit more uh, intense and in detail. W one other thing uh, that I guess I, I might mention is, um, it seems like the state is looking to the, the localities to kind of determine what's ARPA eligible. I mean, not, these funds aren't just, they're not just discretionary, you can spend them on anything. They have to meet the intent of the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, so that means, um, you know, they have to, they have to, um, there's just a whole litany of things that they, that they have to do. And they're, they're basically saying, okay, you have a project, now tell us how this is eligible for ARPA, and then we have to determine that and try and convince the state. And then the state will in turn have to, you know, submit all their paperwork to the federal government. So it's, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, it's different than any uh, atmosphere I've ever uh, dealt with as far as the, you know, grants. We're just, everything is fluid. It's changing from week to week. We, two or three weeks ago, we spent uh, three hours in the afternoon with somebody from the Department of Commerce um, kind of going through these things. And uh, it just, from that time to now, things have just changed. So it's just, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's fluid to say <laughs> the least. We just looked this up last week. Uh, can you define spark? <laughs> I forgot. Uh, I should have that memorized by now. <laughs> Serving people and revitalizing Kansas. Serving people and revitalizing Kansas. Oh, I would have missed that one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we will adjourn now and meet back at 4 o'clock.
and I just wondered, uh, you know, she had a tally, and I didn't know who's officially on this committee and who's yeah. not. And, uh, okay. what, what year is that? We're, we're, we're going to go ahead and get uh, started. This is the February 7, 2022, regular weekly meeting of the Salina City Commission. I want to start asking the City Clerk if the Kansas Open Meeting Act required notice has been properly provided. Yes. Thank you. In that case, could you proceed with roll call, please? Mayor Davis? Here. Commissioner Hoppick? Here. Commissioner Linkowitz? Here. Commissioner Longvine? Here. Commissioner Ryan? Here. All right. All who are able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. We will proceed to awards and proclamations. 3.1, recognition of the month of February 2022 as Black History Month in the city of Salina. Hannah Rivers, Human Relations Commission will read the proclamation. May need someone to read it in her place. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and if you could just give the clerk and our audience your name. Okay, my name is Marissa Patton. I am um, a community relations specialist. Thank you. Okay. Whereas 1976, Black History Month has been officially recognized and celebrated throughout the United States of America, focusing on the contributions that African Americans have made to American history in their struggles for freedom and equality, thus deepening our understanding of the United of our nation's history. And whereas Black History Month is an opportunity for all Americans, regardless of color, to honor the rich cultural heritage and legacy of people of African descent. This time allows us to celebrate the contributions across social, cultural, economic, artistic, and political life in America made by African Americans. And whereas our responsibility as citizens is to acknowledge and address the inequalities and injustices that still linger today. Let us reflect on the sacrifices and contributions made by generations of African Americans, and let us remember and honor those who have fought against societal norms and unjust laws. Whereas the citizens of Salina has been in the forefront of efforts to establish a compassionate society based on the inherent dignity of all of its members, and by taking a leadership role in proactive education efforts, and with the end goal of eliminating all forms of discrimination and disadvantage. We continue to work to become an inclusive community in which all citizens, past, present, and future, are respected and recognized and allowed to enjoy their full rights as citizens of the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I could put you totally on the spot and ask uh -huh. if you are aware of any activities. I know that there was um, an art exhibit at the Kansas Wesleyan University this month. Yes, and mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone from Kansas Wesleyan is here. I know it was still up Saturday when I was there mm -hmm. for a uh, Black History Month brunch, and mm -hmm. it's a very nice exhibit just in the commons area. And there's a fashion show there, and I want to say the 11th, but that might not be. Yeah, I'm not certain about that. Okay, uh, but Kansas Wesleyan is, is uh, taking a lead in and promoting events for Black History Month. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we always want, and I'm going to have you come forward to get <coughs> signed copy and have your picture taken. You know, while Black History Month is celebrated just in February, uh, you know, black history in the United States is truly the history of the United States. And, you know, with, with time, you know, the, the true success of this will be 
the rewriting of American history books to include the full history of this of this country. So this is sort of a remedial course this month, once a year. Uh, but it's it's really the history of the United States uh, just being told from a different perspective. We will move on to the Citizens Forum, which is an opportunity for anyone to come to the microphone to uh, talk on an issue uh, that's not on today's agenda. We just ask that you limit your comments to three minutes, and if you could give your name and uh, where you live, we'd appreciate it. Dalton McDowell, City of Salina. Couple questions. Um, we haven't heard anything new on the hunt for the next fire chief. And then on the housing development, affordable housing should be up there also on doing this housing deal that we need to do for this town. Three, four hundred thousand dollar houses are nice, but not everybody can afford them. I know with building materials, they've went up thousands and thousands on a house. It's like, I think the highest was 300% from what I was told. Um, we should look at developing some of these vacant buildings like the old hospital that they've tried to develop three times or twice at least that was just sold and then give uh, tax breaks for the companies that want to come in and build and another issue is your guys's codes for construction some of the codes are complete a complete joke some of them are some of them are decent some of them are permitting is an is annoying contracting licenses for the city of salina it'd be nice if some of these licensing you guys would take from other towns like city of wichita some other towns there on uh, my when when i go spraying some of my licensing for spraying and doing what i do will transfer state to state. Towns really don't have much to say on it because it's a state license. It'd be nice if some of your licensing would transfer s town to town if there's an agreement there. As of now, there's not very many agreements with transferring of licensing from town to town. So you have to go get permits and then you have to go get license in each and every town. I just think that should be something that you guys look at to bring in contractors. There's tons of contractors in town. A lot of them don't wanna do residentials or if they do, that's all they do. I think that's some stuff you should look into. Thank you, just, you, you, thank you. Point for me, which, which uh, commissioner board uh, would he? Uh, the building the, advisory board. Go, go to building advisory board. Correct. Okay. So we can get you the date and time of the building advisory. Okay, thank you. Norman Mountain Salina, as I stated earlier, any water fight between states can last for years. They have taken years to dissolve these legal disputes over this de decades. Some of this goes back to 1897. The water issue was brought up a supply canal was going to be built from up here at White Cloud. And it was coming right through this area and it was going to go down here to Lindsburg. And that water was going out to Scott City. You're not going to get any access to it. That fell through. It's going to cost too much. It's still about water. I don't know how long it's going to take you people to realize this. Because the cost Operating costs for that canal just for one day was $1,300 a day, $485,000 a year. That has been dropped. That is no longer on the table. That canal is not going to be built. They're trying to do this again up in Nebraska and Colorado. 
it's going to cost too much for whatever you do anymore. Where are we going to get the money to do this? Paper money. So I just wanted to tell you again, Nebraska has been in a fight with Kansas over the Republican <coughs> River, which runs through Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas. It was a similar compact improved in 1943. Maybe you guys ought to subscribe to this paper. Because <laughs> this little lady gives it to me for free out of Colorado. As the publisher of this paper said, the good times are over. He says, I hope not. We've had a good run for 70 years. You start looking at everything that happened since 1955 after the war. We've had it all nice, you guys. Money was made. Good times. But it's over. I called Pete. I said, yeah, Pete. It's over, isn't it? He says, yeah, it is. Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone? <coughs> I'm sorry, we have someone here coming forward. Hi, commissioners. Good afternoon on a beautiful February day. Uh, praise the Lord for a beautiful day. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you've noticed over the last few weeks, there's been somebody absent from our group, and it's one of the uh, leaders of the Granny Brigade here in town, and she's been in the hospital with COVID for the last week and a half. And I'm very thankful to say, by the grace of God, the great staff at, at uh, Salina Regional, uh, she is heading home today, and, and very, very thankful for that. But she did want me to pass along that the petition still has not been put into place. So I, I wanted to make sure I passed that along to you guys today. Um, as far as the other point I wanted to make, and, and I, I really don't know um, um, how much effect you guys can have about this, but I was asked to bring this up in the city commission, so I am following through on that request. Uh, a few months ago with all of the uh, election and everything that was going on, we kept hearing ideas that our, our Salina schools are in good shape, and boy, they're, they're what brings people to our community, and I did a little bit of research on this. I brought this up to the school board uh, last month, and I've received no response with them o over the last couple of months, uh, but our Salina schools um, are not in good shape academically, and we as citizens need to put some pressure on our school board, uh, on our superintendent, so forth, to make sure that our children are being taught in the correct way. Kansas ranks education-wise 29th in the country uh, from top to bottom, which is about midway, and, and I was excited when I moved here from Mississippi, uh, because in Mississippi, we were always in the bottom three or four states in the, in the nation in education. I was thinking, boy, we're gonna have a good education system here, and uh, I, I've done some research, and here, I'm going to give some rankings just, just for your information, and these are the statistics that I've been asked to pass along very quickly. Uh, as far as elementary schools here in Salina, out of 667 elementary schools in the state, Stewart is ranked 251st, Meadowlark is ranked 258th, Coronado 345th, Huesner 381st, Oakdale 482, Schilling 488, Cottonwood is ranked 547, and Sunset is ranked 555 out of 667 elementary schools in our state. Middle schools are not much better. There are 366 middle schools in our state. Salina South Middle is ranked 235. Lakewood is ranked 298th in the state. High schools, where we are getting reports that people are graduating with a third grade reading education. Salina High School South is ranked 215 out of 320 high schools in the state, and Salina High Central is ranked 236th out of 320 high schools in the state. Overall, our district is ranked 220th in the state, in that 220th group. Uh, we need to put some pressure on our education leaders. Again, I don't know what, Im what impact you guys can have on it, but I was asked to bring that up so that people in our community would be able to see that, hear that, and put some pressure on the administrators um, in there. If you have answers to how we can improve our education, uh, we would love to hear them. Uh, we're not getting any response from our school board at this point. Any, is there anyone on line, Mr. Butch? No. All right. Thank you for the comments, and 
rather sobering statistics. Uh, we will move on to public hearings and items scheduled for a certain time. 5.1 Public Hearings McShares Inc. Tax Exemption. 5.1A Conduct Public Hearing. 5.1B Approve Resolution Number 22 8022, making certain findings of fact as required by KSA 79 251. 5.1C Approve Ordinance Number 22 11099, exempting certain property in the City of Salina, Kansas from ad valerium taxation for economic development purposes. I guess you're taking the lead on uh, Yes, I'll, <laughs> I'll start. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as I'm sure you recall, on the 24th of January, you received a report on, on this topic. Uh, Mitch Robinson from the Salina Community Economic Development Organization uh, was the prime presenter on that. And attached to this staff report is all the information that was distributed on the, the 24th. Um, it pertains to a proposed expansion of uh, McShares or a Repco property on North Street. And so when we talk about the project, and the project is limited to that proposed expansion. Um, and the conversation that you had on the 24th, you ultimately voted to instruct staff to move forward with the matter and set a date of February 7th for a public hearing. Uh, which is the, the hearing that you'll need to conduct today. And as the city clerk read off, there's really three action items associated with this item. Conducting the public hearing, uh, resolution uh, making certain findings as required by Kansas statute regarding eligibility, um, and then approving an ordinance that exempts certain property and, and the project from taxation. And in that ordinance, it, it also authorizes execution of a tax incentive agreement. Um, and so, the, the gist of the project has been discussed before, but it's a six to seven million dollar investment in an expansion to the Repco site. Uh, they've committed to an additional five jobs to uh, be in place within 12 months of completion of that project. It came to you with a recommendation from the SEEDO for 100% property tax abatement on the project. Uh, which is how the, the tax incentive agreement's been prepared. Um, and so it, at this point, um, it would be appropriate for you to conduct the hearing, um, to then close the hearing, consider uh, the resolution and the ordinance. Myself, Mitch Robinson from the EDO, and Sarah Steele from Gilmore and, and Bell, our bond counsel, is on, on the line available to answer questions as well. Um, the thing that I would point you to in, in the staff report is uh, same information that was pre provided previously, but in the financial um, impact portion of the, the report, it provides you a breakdown of the abatements and then cost benefit uh, calculations that were prepared by Wichita State University. And suffice it to say that each one of those benefit uh, cost ratios turn out to be positive in, in excess of one, demonstrating that uh, ultimately uh, the community in each one of those taxing entities would benefit uh, beyond the property taxes abated. Um, and with that, I don't want to repeat myself too much in terms of the, the details of the project that you previously discussed. It, it's all there in the report, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I'll quickly, a, in addition to Mitch Robinson and Sarah Steele, there's representatives of the, of the company here as well. So um, again, it's a, 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 as previously discussed, sets up a 100% tax abatement for 10 years um, for the expansion portion of the project that's proposed. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, I'll let the other commissioners go first. Commissioner Hoppe. None here. Just in the definition of the completion of the project, as far as when the five new jobs would be anticipated. Because uh, some part of the construction might linger for three and a half years, not in the, you know, so that's a three and a half year window. Uh, if a significant portion of it's done within 18 months, you know, then I'm looking, expecting something in 18 months. Is, is there right any cleaner definition of that? Um, I may actually look to to Sarah Steele if she could, you know, was able to pick up that question, Sarah. That the concern is that if the pro it, we've set it up to where. Uh, the jobs have to be in place 12 months after completion of the project, and the concern is that the, the project lingers um, such that it, 
it's an extended amount of time before completion, which then calls into question the timing of the job creation. Um, can you speak to the agreement provisions as it relates to that? Certainly, this uh, constitutional exemption that you're doing today can only be applied for once the project is actually complete and a certificate of occupancy would need to be issued for the addition. Once that occurs, then we can make the application for property tax exemption. So it is not in the best interests of the company to have a long protracted construction period. Um, but as, as Mr. Sprague pointed out, it's uh, the employment has to occur within 12 months of the completion of the project. And I might ask if the um, representatives there from the company could speak as to their projected timeline. Afternoon, uh, Monty White, CEO of McShares. Um, as you know, the cart before the horse, we're trying to get all our plans in place. We'll know better on completion of the project once we actually get this process finished. We finish our plans and we obviously begin uh, trying to find uh, construction materials and all those things. but. The company, um, ourselves, and the construction companies um, really want to make this as fast as possible. Um, they gave us a little more aggressive window than I think they'll hit, but you know we hope to do it um, probably a little over a year once we start, whenever it is that we start. So, does that answer the question? Well, yeah. No, that, that, that answers the question. I, that, just a follow-up question from Ms. Steele. Yes. Uh, does the tax abatement, it does not, uh, does not get applied retroactively? It, Correct. Okay. It's prospective. So uh, that will be done only upon completion this is a different process than we normally do with industrial revenue bonds, um, and it requires completion before the county appraiser and the Board of Tax Appeals can accept a, an application. All right. Thank you. But as I mentioned last time, we've, you know, we've already started actually looking at hiring people um, because some of them we can get trained and up before or complete with the project. So, and that's a good point. In recognition that they are actively trying to hire, we've set this up to recognize their current employment as the base number. And if they hire in advance and completion of the project, that's all the better. And right. would they get credit for that going forward? Today's right. workforce, it's difficult to hire people these days. So we need all the time we can get. So. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. So <coughs> now. Uh, were there any other, any other speakers would be during the hearing? Um, yes, it would be appropriate to take public comment as part of the hearing and close the hearing and proceed to the resolution and the ordinance. All right, and uh, just for you, Mr. Sprague, did you, probably the answer to that question would be no, would you address in uh, easy to understand terms the formula sure. that's typically used to arrive at what our incentive op offerings would be? Right. Um, we have a resolution in place, resolution number 914265, so it, it's from 1991, that um, <clears throat> provides a couple of things. It, it accounts for the capital investment level and it accounts for the employment level and then it provides a formula um, and, and it kind of stratifies the first million of investment, the second million, um, creates a formula for calculation. Um, and then the premise is that whatever that calculated amount is, is for years one through five, and then 50% of that calculated amount is, is available for years six through 10. There's also a provision that um, if the project is located in a designated special redevelopment area, that they, they get a premium um, just for recognition that 
it's in an area identified as, as kind of a priority location for development in the community. And so the last two pages of the staff report are two incentive calculations based on that formula, on one being a, a $6 million project and the other being a $7 million project. Mm -hmm. Recognizing this project is, is kind of in the middle of those, a little bit more than $6, billion, six million, but not seven. Uh, there's, an, there's an allocation there of that base um, uh, uh, investment of $300,000 on one job equates to 25%. The 300000 to a million dollar range uh, adds another 14%. One million to two million adds another 13 and a third percent. Two million to six million is 26.67. So that um, equates to 79%. And then uh, there is the special redevelopment area premium of 50% as well. So 50% of uh, adding another 50% on 79% would be 130.5%. Obviously, we're not going to exceed 100%. So then in years uh, 6 through 10, that 50% that calculation could either be 50% of the 100 or 65.25 if you gave them 50% of that 130% calculation. That is the strict formula that's in Resolution 91. Um, as we discussed it, when you took this up on the 24th, the resolution also does have a provision in it that provides the governing body wide discretion either to not grant incentives or, or deviate from the, the resolution at your discretion. Um, and so the EDO, the, the SEEDO board, um, took up uh, this consideration directly with uh, representatives of REPCO in one of their board meetings and, and ultimately the initial, there was conversation about just straight capital investment, no job creation commitment, or a combination of capital investment and job commitment. The EDO board suggested that they would, would support a recommendation of 100% property tax abatement over the 10 years if the investment level was hit and there was also the commitment to uh, at least five jobs. So what came to you on the 24th was the EDO's recommendation of 100% and based on your direction to proceed, that's what we've incorporated into the agreement that's attached today. Okay. Is that option for making exceptions to the policy, has that been vested to the EDO or is that solely? Well, there, I'm sorry to interrupt, go ahead. Is it solely a commission? Yeah, it, it is solely commission discretion. The EDO is serving as an advisory body to the governing body like any other advisory board. So I think their, their recommendation is in recognition that you ultimately, the you being the governing body, ultimately have discretion, but that it would be your final determination. All right, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Scrape? All right, in that case, we will, one of these sheets of paper here, open, uh, conduct a public hearing. That's easy enough to say. Uh, open the public hearing at this point. Uh, did, Mitch, did you want to yes, speak? Sir. Please come forward. Thank you. Um, Mitch Robinson, Executive Director of Solana Community Economic Development Organization. As uh, the city manager laid out in a very perfect form, uh, the actions that the Solana Community Economic Development Board met with um, Monty White, uh, his finance director, uh, Mr. Mays, and reviewed the project and, and we had a extensive discussion uh, at our uh, meeting in uh, November and reviewed it and laid out a couple options uh, to the company. Uh, they came back to us uh, within a couple days of uh, choosing, uh, as talked about the investment and the job mm -hmm. creation and uh, we pass that uh, recommendation on to the city manager uh, that, that day and feel very strongly uh, this is a, a great company. It's had a long history here in Salina. Uh, we want to support their efforts on uh, promoting manufacturing and, and really they have, a, as, as you all heard uh, two weeks ago, a very unique product, uh, something that many of us probably eat on a daily basis that we take uh, in through either wheat or rice or other food products. So, uh, you know, again, we feel uh, supportive and 
are here for the public hearing to voice our support and answer any questions that the commission may have. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Robinson? Just to maybe a comment, since we're using an old policy here, and maybe we're stepping slightly away from it. Uh, what's your experience, and I hope that the staff is, is looking into the questioning we did about it, the age of the policy and what everybody around us is doing. Do you have any ins experience or uh, with what the other communities are doing? Has this I have, opened up or yes. has it tightened up? I have, uh, it has opened up uh, mm -hmm. some in some communities and some communities have tightened it down. So uh, we have looked at uh, several different communities and are in the process of coming back to the commission in the future with some recommendations, but uh, we're not quite ready yet to do that. But, Thank you. Uh, we've looked at uh, several communities. Thanks. I, I, I guess my concern may follow that. Uh, I hate to change or define our policy as we decide individual cases, because then we just sort of hop around and yes, sir. And then there is no policy because it gets right. established every Monday afternoon when we have a, a, a different proposal in front of us. Is, is that, uh, what would be the proper format for you and the city commission to, and this is I guess, to you and Mr. Scree, for us to formally review this policy it, well, the effort that's taken place so far is to inventory uh, peer communities in Kansas, and um, well, that's been a conversation that's included uh, Mitch and, and city staff and Sarah Steele from Bond Council. I guess the way I envision this is ultimately the EDO is the advisory body. Mitch kind of working that through the EDO for um, a, a report and options and then their recommendation to you and bringing forward um, that recommendation and formalizing that policy again they can make a recommendation ultimately you use the governing body to have final determination you can give us direction after you've received that recommendation and we can turn that into an updated policy All right because I guess if I was being advised by someone this is what we're going to take to the to the body I'd probably have some degree of confidence well if if their consulting organization recommended it it must be all right, and then uh, we certainly look like evil people. If you say, well, no, I don't know why I promised you that, uh, because our policy clearly states this, and I, I just like to I, debate I, that, you know, be, before <laughs> we, get, right. we get here. With Most definitely. Yeah. And I, I, it's our opinion is we want to have a solid policy that reflects today's economic development current and present activities and be able to respond to that right. and uh, we're in a very competitive world right now right now the discussion is about workforce and we're in a very competitive workforce discussion right. and uh, it all comes together uh, but we have to be able to when we do get that question about incentives and and that unfortunately is has gotten to be a negative uh, some people view that in a negative way for me, for what I do, it's something that's just part of the process, much like, you know, what is your workforce? What is the city or and, and or county willing to do for uh, comp different companies on different projects? Right. Now, and what is it about this project that would distinguish it from a smaller project? But just you know, Mr. X wants to expand his business and uh, and, and keeps this from being a president, you know, or a blueprint for any business that wants, because any business expanding basically is economic development. We, we hope it our is. businesses want to expand. It is. So what, what peculiar features about this would merit the special consideration? Manufacturing would be one. That's, uh, you know, a targeted industry, advanced manufacturing, which this is, you know, has a lot of technical uh, higher end uh, R&D type activity that they do with their lab. So that's a positive. Uh, the wage level is above the, the county average wage for these these five positions. Um, you know, it's a, it's a solid investment in a project that's gonna help continue to keep the company uh, within the community. So retention of existing jobs would be another plus check off, uh, I see. Um, 
So, you know, there's there's several other things that I, think I could probably ramble off, and but I think those are the, the main ones. So there'd be like a floor below which a similar project would not qualify for the same special? Uh, so I, I know you, every, you, you every just have project, to look at each one. Yeah. And it's every project you have to totality, look at and review right. and see how it fits, and that's something that we want to make sure that the new format works to either definitely say this is no, not an eligible project, or definitely say, and uh, that's that's unfortunately, the, the, the key word is flexibility, and sometimes that, uh, it, it, it's not sometimes, it's usually often required in some of these projects, but I think we need to come up with a solid plan that works for all projects, right. or doesn't. Right, thank you. Other question? Okay. I, yeah. I again, as I mentioned last time, I think we're working off a 91 resolution, which the landscaping and economic development has changed significantly since then. So, one of the to to answer my answer to one of the questions you had, uh, Mayor Davis, is, you know, this is a business that doesn't compete against another business in Salina. You know, the one we dealt with last time, there was some concern that it was a service business. You know, this is a completely different business. Uh, that doesn't compete against any other local businesses. And I think this is either for Mr. Scrag or for, for Mr. Robinson, but I do believe based on the Wichita State study that the benefit cost analysis ratio did support the 100% for 10 years, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so so again, I do want us to uh, to review the uh, our policy, but again, I, I don't want us to paint ourselves into a corner either. I still think you have to have some flexibility depending on different different variables that can come up. So I would I would just like to opine that uh, um, I don't think I could support any policy that strictly uh, took away the power of the commission to judge each project independently. I think there's enough uniqueness in every thing that comes before this that we need to reserve the right to um, step outside the policy, so. Yeah, just exactly, I'm trying to remember the last time that we actually did 100% for five and 50% Yeah, for we five. did a percentage because part of the building was gonna be used for manufacturing, the other was probably gonna be leased out and, and not part of the. Well, that was a percentage of the total, of right. it, but just the. I don't. It, it's just been a while, and, and if the policy is outdated. But I think we ended up to make it simple. We used a percentage of the total, total. the total uh, tax base. Yeah. And it might not. Is that not correct? Um, th that is correct. We yeah. that particular pro the project you're referring to, the Superior, Superior. Plumbing Project, um, included relocation of existing businesses to a new location. And the original ask I think was for full property tax abatement at the new location, as well as property that was, was gonna be undeveloped or available for future development. And so the EDO came up with a formula and then you reviewed that as well, trying mm -hmm. to kind of parse out how much of that was unique new increment and, and targeted it at that. And so it, it wasn't 100% as originally requested. Right, right. Uh, if the applicant wish to make any more statements. <laughs> no, all right open the uh, floor to anyone from the public who wishes to make any comments. Chad Farber, Salina. Is there a short summarization of this policy that we keep throwing around that we're saying we're evading or, or, or changing or, or going around? Um, it, it's attached in its entirety to the, the staff in, report. In the staff report. Yep. Um, I'm kind of torn because I, I've skimmed over it, you know, and I may not be the smartest person uh, in the world. Uh, no comment from anybody on the commission there. But I, some of the, the language was a little confusing to me. I'm torn because I want to support the businesses, especially in this climate, we need to support our businesses. But on the flip side, what good is a policy if we're just going to adjust around it? Um, and uh, again, that's, that's just my two cents worth. Um, if, if the policy needs to be updated, that's something that, that the city needs to look at, uh, if it's outdated or if it just needs to be a guideline, uh, but that's, that's just my input on it. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Anyone online, Mr. Wood? No, all right. 
and Ms. Steele, since you've been sitting there patiently, did you have any other comments that you wanted to add? No, I, I must admit, I think um, a good portion of the uh, responsibility for coming up with some recommendations is also in my court. So um, I will be working with Mr. Robinson and, and Mr. Scrag and trying to get something moving on that. Um, for purposes of policy versus guidelines, I, I like that comment. The statutes require that you have a policy in order to grant the type of economic development exemption that you're considering today. We could do a policy for that and we could do guidelines for IRBs, but um, they'd probably end up being in the same place. So I don't have anything further unless you have any questions. Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mayor, there is somebody online. I'm not sure if they're okay. wanting to speak, but um, if you're on Zoom and, and you want to comment, if you'd raise your digital hand or just uh, make a motion there in your camera, there's one individual on that's not normally on, so. Okay. <laughs> I think that answers that. Okay. Hearing no other comments, I will close the public hearing and ask commissioners if there's any action to be taken on resolution number 22-8022. Mayor, I move we approve resolution number 22-8022, making certain findings of fact as required by KSA 79251 with respect to a property tax exemption to be granted to McShares, Inc. Second. I was seconded, okay. And, uh, okay. It's been uh, moved and approved, I'm sorry, moved and seconded to approve resolution 22-8022. Any unreadiness? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Is there any action on ordinance 22 11099? Mayor Davis, I move we approve ordinance number 22 11099, exempting certain property in the city of Salina, Kansas, from ad valorem taxation for economic development purposes pursuant to Article 11, Section 13 of the Kansas Constitution providing the terms and conditions for ad valerium tax exemption and describing the property so exempted. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve ordinance number 22-11099. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five to nothing. Thank you very much and good luck with the project. We'll move to the consent agenda. 6.1, approve the minutes of January 24, 2022. 6.2, award the bid for project number 22003-2022 pavement ceiling to Circle C Construction in the amount of $287,776.91 with a 5% construction contingency for a total project authorization not to exceed $302,165,000, I'm sorry, $302,165.76 and authorize the city manager to execute a contract with Circle C Construction upon fulfillment of all prerequisites under the bid documents. Okay, uh, does the commissioner wish each of these two items to be removed for discussion? All right, thank you. Entertain Mayor, I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. We moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5 nothing, And we can move on to administration. <clears throat> 7.1, authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Tyler Technologies for utility billing software in the amount of $193,448 with a 5% contingency for a total cost of $203,120. Ms. Pack. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Debbie Pack, Director of Finance. Uh, the current utility billing software is held on an AS400 platform, which is a very obsolete platform, as well as this, this software is a very complex software. It currently, we, we currently have multiple vendors and P 
pieces of software that have to pull data from meters, put that information into a billable um, language, then push out statements, and then allow people to come in and pay against those statements in multiple fashions, whether it's over the phone, credit card, on the website. And the current system has multiple vendors that take care of that whole umbrella. So um, we've been looking at, because this is an obsolete platform, we've been looking at replacing this. It did become a, a strategic planning op item in 2021 um, to replace the utility billing software. Since about 20, the early 2020, water customer accounting staff and finance staff have been reviewing and looking at all the pieces of this process, uh, reviewing and researching different um, replacements for these pieces and trying to look at different options to look at for the, the utility billing software in general. Um, in early 2021, we formed a team which comprised of the finance de uh, department, water customer accounting staff, uh, the continuous process improvement director, the S deputy city manager, and the computer technology staff to look at the options and the, and the different pieces of software that we had researched and that we had looked and demoed. Um, the team reviewed all those options and kind of came back to the consensus that um, we did have a current software provider that we were using for another um, so software system for our, our financials that did offer utility billing software. So we looked at their product to see if it would meet our needs and we certainly found that it did, exceeded some of the expectations that we had. We did several demos with them. We had multiple phone calls with them trying to hash out what they could do, what they couldn't do, what they could replace and what they, you know, different types of things. And we found that, and this group found that, we, we felt like the, the current provider was able to provide the system that we needed um, and also, besides being a current provider, which we were always already used to dealing with, they were able to replace multiple of these vendors that, that we have in this big umbrella to do this process. So we, um, the, the team um, decided that Tyler Technologies, which has a utility billing and cash sharing software product, was able to replace our current billing software and we felt like they would be able to, to replace uh, multiple systems within that process. Um, it also currently, besides having a connection to our finance system, which will eliminate manual steps to input information into our finance system, it also has the capability to read directly with our current meter reading um, software. The city's purchasing policy allows the city to util utilize what's called a sole source purchasing, which is we don't go out for a formal RFP, if it provides capability with an, uh, or compatibility with an existing system or the continuation of an existing project in which knowledge for specific work has been demonstrated. Using the same vendor that so the city currently uses for financial software, we felt like met that criteria. City staff, once we determined that they would, could provide what we wanted to, them to provide as far as the software, the utility billing software, we asked Tyler to provide us two separate quotes one was to house the software on premise within the city's software confines so that we had access to that, which is what we have now. And also to, we asked them to provide us a quote to host it out on the cloud, which is what a lot of people are going to and, and has its pros and cons. The first two quotes that I have um, provided in the staff report were the on-premise um, side of the software where that is on the city server and is accessible to city staff. The total cost for that um, project was $193,448 of that recurring fees of $17,100. The one-time fees that are provided in the quote provided are for configuration of software, implementation, training, as well as data conversion for five years of data, which is required by our retention policy. The recurring fee is for annual maintenance and, and support for the city for that product. The city currently pays about $64,000 in annual fees for the current multiple providers um, that will be eliminated and that so it'll provide about a $47,000 savings for the city. The third and fourth quotes that I attached to the, the, um, the staff report were for hosting the software offsite by Taylor, Tyler Technologies. It is for a three-year contract because that commitment requires them to put all the information out on their cloud and so it's a lot more upfront work and not really worth it to go back and forth year after year. So this is a three-year contract. 
those quotes came in because we were also going to be required because we're tying into our Munis financial system to upgrade that system into a cloud system as well. So that project came in at a, at a quoted price of $938,612. Of that, recurring fees of $698,673 for a three-year period. The city currently pays about $80,000 in maintenance for the Munis financial system. And with the addition of the 17, approximately $17,000 that was quoted above, that's a total of $97,000 a year or $291,000 for a three-year period. That compared to the $698,000 could provide the city a savings of, five, of a little over $400,000. Um, conversations with the staff on the team and computer technology staff did not find that the benefits of having housing the system on the cloud, um, having that hosted was worth this additional cost. So the staff will be, is recommending that that be on premise. Implementation of the software is expected to take 12 to 18 months, depending on the availability of our staff and the Tyler staff. $150,000 for this project was budgeted in the water customer accounting 2022 budget, and the remainder of the cost will be absorbed into the utility fund balance, which may require a budget amendment at the end of the year. Staff has identified the following options. To approve a motion acknowledging that we're utilizing section 9.1 of the purchasing policy, which allows for sole source purchase, and also, also authorizing the city manager to execute the, the agreement with Tyler Technologies. Or option two is to approve the motion with amendments the city commission deems appropriate. Postpone consideration of the proposed agreement with Tyler to a specific time and date. And, uh, and let us know what additional information we could bring you forward. Or take no action, which in effect is disproving the pro proposed agreement. Staff um, recommends option one. I do have staff from Water Customer Accounting and the team that was on, the, on this team, as well as a representative from Tyler Technologies is on Zoom if you have any questions for any of us. Any questions? Uh, my only question is, uh, we're showing that by keeping it in-house, we have a savings of approximately 400000 um, By keeping it in-house and not being on the cloud, is there any uh, additional staffing necessary or anything? No, because we're already, we already okay. keep it in-house. What we will have is server capacity that we will have to deal with. Mm -hmm. What I heard from computer technology, and I know Reed is on, on Zoom, is that the benefit to keeping in house gives our staff access to that database as opposed to being on the cloud where we would not have access to our own information basically. But she didn't indicate that it would require additional staff okay. just to maintain that. I'm that just software. curious if there, by being in house, if there's an additional cost would eat into that potential savings. So right. That's my question. Thank you. There will also be some offset because we'll be getting rid of some older software that, that just is really hard to maintain and keep up to date. So mm -hmm. there will be a little bit of offset the AS as far as that goes. Yeah, I didn't even know there's still AS400s yeah. out there. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Any questions from the public? Mayor, I have a I'm sorry. Question. Commissioner Longby. Uh, yeah. Upgrading to this, will this completely uh, mothball the AS400 system? There is some data still on the AS400, but our hopes is to get all of the data that we need off of that AS400 to get rid of it eventually, yes. So in conjunction with this project, computer technology is working with the other departments to identify that data and, and whether we need it anymore, and if so, off put it somewhere else. And w would there be additional cost savings? Uh, when I get my water bill, I, <laughs> I always think I've had it on electronic debit forever and I throw that envelope, return envelope away. <laughs> Would there be the prospect of e-billing? I believe in the system, I'll look to my team members, I believe they did have that capability of to put your email in there and to have that all emailed. There was a lot of information, so I wouldn't, don't quote me on that. Okay. Jeff Keller might be able to answer that question from Tyler on, he should be online. I'm laughing because about 10 years ago, I asked, uh, can I opt out of getting the envelope because I, you know, it comes out electric, and I was politely told no. <laughs> you know, so well, and the reason I've been for that recycling is recycling these envelopes for you know, right. 15, 20 years. We automatically <laughs> we have a system that automatically folds and stuffs envelopes, stuffs bills. So if you're getting a paper bill, the, the piece of hardware that puts that all together automatically puts an envelope in there. 
it's not a software issue, it's a hardware, it's a hardware item. I don't know how, how long we've had the AS400, but that technology came out 44 years ago. 44? So, yes. So part of that is, you know, the, we've stuck with the AS400 this long, and then we just kind of tacked on some a little bit of functionality, but nothing like, right. you know, you might expect. Um, this should uh, get us in the correct century. Yeah. Well, I definitely <laughs> concur with right. moving along and with the unsupported equipment and software that uh, it, it's just had its time. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from you to come up to the podium or a comment may not be a question. Uh, mainly just a comment and a question after could, could you give Steve Rothenberger. I'm sorry. Uh, right. I've resident here for 35 years. Having in my manufacturing career worked with the AS400, which yes, it's dinosaur technology. This new one that you're proposing, it has better security pr protocols also versus someone being able to hack it and things of that nature, does it not? Okay, that's something that needs to probably be considered. Thank you. And I would think there would be some s better safeties in having it in-house than send it to the cloud also, mm. as far as being able to. Mm. All right, any questions or comments online? No, nope. all right, bring it back to the commission for action. Mayor, I make a motion to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Tyler Technologies for utility billing software in the amount of $193,448 with a 5% contingency for a total of a cost of $203,120. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded mm -hmm. to uh, execute the agreement with Tyler Technologies as read. Oh, yes, sir. Sole source so, sir. election. Sure. Yeah. That's something in the discretion again yeah. of the commission that we yeah. make sure it's clear that that is your that is your okay. it, it just gets you on record that we are yeah. intentionally uh, doing this by a sole source selection. Let me read it again, Councilor. If, yeah. If you don't mind, mm -hmm. I'll that. Okay. <laughs> Mayor, I make a motion to approve. To approve a motion acknowledging that the department is utilizing section 9.0 of the city's purchasing policy which allows for the sole purchase of utility billing software and payments software and authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with Tyler Technology for utility billing software in the amount of $193,448. One hundred ninety-eight thousand dollars, four hundred forty-eight, with a five percent contingency for a total of two hundred and three thousand one hundred and twenty dollars. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to execute a sole source purchase agreement with Tyler Technologies, as described. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five nothing. Thank you. Seven point two. 7.2, special assessments for improvements. 7.2A, certify final costs for 2021 special assessment projects and set February 28, 2022 as the date of public hearing. 7.2B, approve ordinance number 22-11100, levying special assessments for improvements. Uh, Mayor Davis, uh, I will recuse myself uh, on this item. Don't go far. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. This is Mr. Stack. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. This is got a few maps here that Jacob's going to pull up. I hope just to kind of explain where we're at. This this is a long ways down the uh, process of our assessment project. So I thought there's a few new commissioners here. At least show them the areas that these uh, projects were in. Magnolia Hills Estates, number two. <clears throat> is our first one here and we opened up uh, about 29 lots in this area right here with the infrastructure so, 
And then this area here is actually future assessment, uh, or it's, it's a part of this project because they do benefit some because some of the water and sewer lines were put in um, and, and actually the storm sewer pond there as well was put in for the project. So uh, phase two of Magnolia Hills number two is going to be soon coming to you all. Yeah, Mr. Stack. Yes. For people, could you identify the street on the side just so long? That's a good question. What is that street? Or the big one, the main. Yeah, he's looking for a kind of vicinity. Centennial, or not Mark, Centennial. Markley and Markley. Holmes. Markley, yeah, Markley. Um, okay. okay, and Holmes. This is actually Holmes here, so that okay. helps. Holmes, this is, um, yeah, Lauren talked, Ms. Driscoll talked a lot about Holmes today. Well, you can kind of see a little bit why this, all of this project here drains over to the uh, the, the large interceptor sewer. So that's why that mm -hmm. um, is, is going to develop someday, but it's still got some challenge of home ro Holmes Road as well as connecting some water out there. But anyway, we're talking about these lots here, 29, uh, like I said, Magnolia Hills 2, phase 2 will come to you soon. And so that's that's the first project here. Property owner share 1.533625.46 million. No city share on that. It's all uh, done by the developers. Go to the next slide there, Jacob. One more. All right. Here is Stone Lake. So if you can blow that up. Um, Stone Lake is our second project here. 1.2 million um, property owner share. Um, well, let's see, go down, let's see. Yeah, one more, I guess. Yeah, there we go, there we go. Um, it's all these lots, these green lots through here. Um, Stone Lake has been in the community for quite a while, started in 2011. Um, Developed this area first, got the lake lots there. The second uh, round of lots is right in here. Those just um, open for, I'd say, development in late summer, and they're already really going strong. So it's that area as, as um, Kelly and um, Craig Piercy and Todd Roberg are Stone Lake, um, Stone Lake LLC, I believe is their name. And so they're building houses in there fairly quickly, and they're going to open up a third phase in here as well to the south of the kind of developed area. So that's the... That's Ohio there. On yes, it is. Ohio on the left side. Thank you. Sorry about that. Almost just, almost quite to Schilling, but not quite. South of here is Schilling. Schilling in Ohio. Okay, D Jacob, you can go to the third one now. Kind of just uh, another aerial view of that one, but keep going. <coughs> All right, and here's the last one. This is a Markley Road trail, similar to Magnolia Hills Estates. Um, it's kind of a long process to um, ass assess this group here for a sidewalk that's over on Markley. So our perimeter road, um, our basically, our, I don't know if it's ordinances or our policies basically talk about um, when you build next to an arterial road that isn't up to interim standard, that doesn't have a, a, a sidewalk on it, then they're required to build that sidewalk. So this group here is required to build a sidewalk over on Markley. This group here, once once it's developed, it'll it'll go to Holmes. So this half of uh, of this group goes and builds their sidewalk on Markley. It's only a five foot sidewalk, and it's only a, a, a group, a small group. You see, this is a forty some lots, I believe, forty five lots that got assessed for us for the sidewalk. Well, of course, the sidewalk benefits a larger community, benefits a lot more people. So that's why there's quite a bit more share here of city share. It's um, part of our trail master plan to connect. Um, you know, Markley to the park to the north here. It's a part of their subdivision um, platting uh, here, so that's why they were required to participate in it at a certain certain extent. So, just a five foot sidewalk. We ended up building a ten, so we we the city uh, put that in our trail funds, use our trails funds for it, as well as this other Magnolia Hills addition, the original addition benefits as well, and that was prior to the requirements to really require them to develop the uh, adjacent street. So the city uh, picked up that cost as well. So it's a fairly small um, cost to this group, and, um, $590 a piece, I believe, approximately. So it's not a large assessment, but it got us a nice sidewalk on, on, on Markley and um, followed the, the policy. So you, you might see more of those in the future, uh, getting, getting more sidewalks put in when we have a plat, hopefully. So I guess try to explain it in pictures. Sometimes it's hard to go through all the pages and actually understand what's going on, but it's assessment projects. The developers um, actually uh, 
had development development agreements on these projects. So they actually uh, built the projects with uh, av kind of advertising on their own, doing their own agreements with contractors, and then we were basically, this is a, they've given us all those costs, and we've made sure that they're legit costs and exactly what they cost, and this is, this is what goes into this um, final assessment. So it's basically that the final cost for all these projects. So um, they will be reimbursed once the bonds are sold at a later date, actually after the April 4th date. So the developers are uh, moving forward with a lot of house building in there, but they'll be glad to get their money for the infrastructure here um, coming up. And this starts the process. So yeah, the first item on your list there is to certify that uh, these final costs and then set the hearing date. And I will um, be here for questions. Dan, Dan, if you would, you might explain our role in inspection when they're contracting for, for okay. the work. Yeah, for um, development projects, um, <coughs> we have a, a city inspector out there pretty much full time. So uh, sometimes, like Cedar Ridge Phase 2 is one that we uh, advertised and bid last year as a city, kind of a city project. Those developers decided just to have the city um, do the administration of it and bid the project. Whereas um, this group, both of these groups, which is uh, Magnolia Hills Inc. and Stone Lake LLC, they, they've they worked with a lot of contractors and they feel like they can get a little better deal. They can they can go out and shake the bushes better than maybe we can and have it not be as public of a bid process. So they were able to, st Stan Byquist is definitely one who's who's utilized this for a long time. He's he's part of Magnolia Hills Inc. and he's he feels like he can market it better um, if he's in charge of it. So they, they like to um, do a more of a development agreement approach. So it's uh, either way, the city inspects it full time, the same as, uh, as, uh, as, as whether it was a city project or a developer project. So it's um, done to city standards and standard details and we have to review the plans the same. So it's, it's fairly similar, it's just uh, there they take a little bit uh, more onus on themselves to actually do the development agreement. Does Matt, that answer that question? Off topic, just a little. Sure. A bit. Uh, so, full time inspector out there, I presume you have a full time inspector at Schwann's. We've got a lot of projects. Yes. Uh, how's your staffing? Uh, <laughs> are we able to inspect everything in a timely manner uh, that we've got, that we're hearing about in the last year and a half? So far, so good. We had um, Schwann's came at a good time um, last year when we weren't. Um, it's kind of, it was kind of in over the, I'd say, winter and spring time, so we weren't as, don't have as many of our overlay projects or our asphalt projects. A lot of us, construction happens in the summer, but for the Schwann's project, they, they were a fast track, and they did, a lot of, they did a lot over the winter last year, a lot of underground utilities, a lot of water and sewer, so we actually had a guy who was out there full-time as well. So if we have another Schwann's project, I think that would overload us, but right now we are we're just, we're steady, I'd say. We have enough um, staff. Get into these housing projects? These yeah, we, and they're, they're, it's interesting, you know, with our community, it's, it's hard to ramp up. So there's only so many contractors to go around. So the contractor who's done these projects is doing all the ones you're hearing about right now, and there's only so many of them. So we pretty much just follow those guys around, and um, I, th I feel like we can keep up. If, they, if we actually do get more contractors that come to town, then it might be a challenge, but right now we're able to keep up with TNR Dirt, who does most of those projects, and um, Smoky Hill, who does our waterline projects, and Stevens is doing those as well. So, and utilities has their own um, staff for inspection as well. So if it's just a utilities project, uh, they are, they're able to kind of keep up with those on their own. Um, so yeah, so far so good. I did just get a new inspector hired actually in November, so that was, that was very helpful, it was just, just the right time. Hmm. Any questions? No, any questions? questions. Uh, well, just, just a second. We'll, 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 we'll bring you up shortly. Uh, I'm not sure whether this should go to Mr. Stack or Mr. Scrig. When, when the city has a share, I'm going to put the word in quotes only, 133000 do we just pay our share once and be done with it, or, or do we bond this out and finance it over? Uh, we have the option of doing either. We we could take on uh, our share as part of that debt issuance. In this particular case, uh, we haven't done that, but um, it, it really kind of depends on the project and, frankly, probably the size of, of the dollar amount. 
Um, but we were able to anticipate this and build it into the, the trail planning. Okay. All right. Public comment. Thank you. For <clears throat> Steve Rothenberger again. Uh, would you please put up the map of Magnolia Hills Estates on the screen, please? Was it the, probably the first or second map, Jacob? Uh, yeah, either one. I have a question. Yeah, right there. Has but it, that's fine. Okay. Has it been determined as this expands to the east, how many exits there will be on Holmes Road? I believe, I believe the, Oh, it hasn't it has not been platted yet i don't believe so um that was that is not for sure yet but okay I've that was a concern a couple of years ago when several of us came here that they were only planning one exit onto holmes road and the people that showed up that day we were all requesting two because the number of houses i live currently just about on the end of case and lane and the additions from where I live to Holmes Road, there's more houses past me, and I'm kind of on the east edge of that now, and it funnels an excessive amount of traffic down Stone Post, which the people that showed up then had some concerns about that at that time. And we were requesting that as this moves across that there be two exits, so that not all the traffic from more houses was being funneled out the west side of uh, the development. So uh, I know there's a number of other people that are gonna be concerned about that as this progresses forward. So that should probably be in the notes to take a look at. Thank you. I can speak to that from the standpoint when the Planning Commission reviewed a preliminary plat for the area extending to Holmes Road, they required that the final plat have two street connections to Holmes Road. Thank you, Mr. Andrew. Thank you. Right. Any other comments from our, the public? If none, uh, if no questions for staff, we'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, let me ask one question. Is, in our blue sheet, uh, these two, 72A and 2B, are written together. Should these be broken up as it's written on the agenda? I don't know if you've looked at that, Mr. Bankson, but uh, the wording is accept the statement of final cost and pass ordinance number 2211100 on first reading. Is it covers it the most probable to roll them together? But we could pick a different date, I guess. <laughs> Let's just do it in two pieces. And then the first reading of the ordinance should probably be separate. separate. Okay. All right. Any action to be taken on 7.2A? Mayor, I move that we certify final costs for the for 2021 special assessment projects and set February 28th, 2022 as the date of the public hearing. We'll second that. It's been moved and seconded to certify a final cost for 2021 special assessment project and set February 28, 2022 as the date of public hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 4-0. Mayor, I would approve ordinance, uh, mo make the motion to approve ordinance number 2211100, levying special assessments for improvement. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve ordinance number 22-11100. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries for nothing. And I believe we can ask Commissioner Hoppick to come back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stack. <clears throat> Item 7.3. 7.3, announcement of mayor's appointment of city commissioners to various boards, commissions, and committees. 
Well, I'm, it doesn't take long. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. So if there's anyone on a particular board, you'll know who your city commission liaison will be. For Commissioner Ryan, Salina Arts and Humanities Commission and the Salina Saline County Building Authority. Commissioner Longbine is getting the deep induction <laughs> training with, with three assignments. Salina Housing Authority, Salina Community Economic Development Organization, and Salina Saline County Building Authority. Commissioner Lenkowitz, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board and North Central Regional Planning Commission, and Commissioner Hoppick, Salina Airport Authority and Convention and Tourism Committee, and I will be on the Chamber of Commerce Board and Library Board. Mayor, may I ask the staff, does the building uh, authority meet like in the next day or two? Is the February <laughs> meeting this week? It would be the third Wednesday. Third Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe. Maybe next week. I think I got an email from her. She said the third Tuesday. Oh, okay. third Tuesday. Yeah. I saw an email, but I didn't look at the date of the meeting. The next meeting is on the 15th. Okay, thank you. All right. We may move on to 7.4. 7.4. Approve resolution number 22 8020, adopting the 20, 2022 to 2026 admitted capital improvement program. Good afternoon, Pat Mayor, Pat Commissioners, Debbie Pack, Director of Finance Administration. <laughs> uh, December 20th, the mm -hmm. City Commission adopted the 2022 through 2026 capital improvement, five year capital improvement program under resolution number 218009. Oh. At the <laughs> November 22nd, 2021, City Commission gave staff direction to move forward with the purchasing of a building. Um, on the general services campus to house new san sanitation, automated sanitation trucks, which did not get included in the original um, uh, CIP program. Um, so this amendment is a request to add the sanitation building <laughs> to the 2022 through 2026 CIP at a cost of $375,000. The intent is to finance that with temporary notes that will be issued in 2022 and uh, with bonds once that project is complete most likely in 2023. The planning commission, this, this did go before the planning commission at their February 1st meeting. They reviewed the proposal and voted unanimously that this did conform with the city's comprehensive plan. Um, went over that. Uh, so basically the options are to approve resolution number 22802, adopting the amended 2022 through 2026 capital improvement program approve the resolution with a, amendments as you deem appropriate, postpone consideration to a specific date and time, or not approve it, which would not give us um, authorization to proceed with this project. Staff would recommend option one. Any questions, comments? No. Thank you. Any questions, comments from the public? Please come on forward. Ben Winhold, Salina. Well, this is probably not on topic of uh, what you're trying to do as far as a resolution, but I have a couple of questions as far as the, in your packet, page two, has all of the projects for 2022. Under that, um, under your debt financed, you're saying the Smoky Hill River uh, renewal project, um, basically, City at large is, is in for 27 million. The cost for um, 2022 is 5 million that you have budgeted for it. I guess the question I have is all of the study sessions and the meetings that they had until we get an agreement from the course of engineer for their 10 million, we're not going to be doing anything at this project. And that's stretched out over a two and a half year period uh, before they actually are going to break ground. So my question is, why are we putting $5 million in on 2022 when the money uh, is not needed as far as the project, except I think I have a feeling that they're going to fast track the downtown area, um, maybe the 4th Street Plaza, and may maybe the money is for that. Second question I have then, as you go back up, look at the parks um, capital improvement plan 
basically, this falls under the sales tax. They have uh, said that they need 500,000 uh, is for 2022. Uh, from the meeting we had three weeks ago, you're $100,000 short because when we take over the tennis complex, the city has to come up with 600,000. So is the rest of the money gonna come out of the parks budget? Um, or what? And I see Martha Tasker is online. She might be able to answer the uh, Smoky Hill renewal project. Yeah, actually, I'd like to give Ms. Pack a first shot at that on both of those, and then if Ms. Tasker needs to supplement that, she can, if you want to. Okay. Yes, on the Smoky Hill River project, um, we will not be funding that project until. Martha and the Corps of Engineers gives us indication that that project's gonna move forward. It is on the plan, but it's not intended to be funded until we actually need those. This is just a preliminary approval of that. The $500,000 for the capital improvement is maintenance, annual allocation of maintenance from sales tax. The $600,000 that's been allocated to the tennis project is coming from the unspent uh, reserve a fund of the Parks and Recreation Fund, not this particular $500,000. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions or comments? Bring it back to the Commission for action. Mayor, I move we approve resolution number 228020, adopting the amended 2022-2026 capital improvement program. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 22-8020. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. <coughs> Motion carries 5 nothing. We move to 7.5. 7.5. Approve ordinance number 22-11097 on second reading, vacating this five-foot alley east of North 3rd Street between Otis Avenue and Include Avenue. All right, this ordinance was passed on first reading on January 24th, and uh, staff has received no comments since then. Any changes or updates to the ordinance since then? Not to my knowledge. All right, any questions or comments? Any comments from the public? Any action to be taken? Mayor Davis, I move we approve ordinance number 22-11097 on second reading. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve ordinance number 22-11097 on second reading and ask yeah, for roll call. roll call. Commissioner Hoppick? Aye. Commissioner Linkowitz? Aye. Commissioner Longbine? Aye. Commissioner Ryan? Aye. Mayor Davis? Aye, that passes five to nothing. Thank you and move now to development business 8.1. 8.1, approve ordinance number 22-11096, amending the Salina zoning ordinance to add section 42-229.1, establishing regulations for short-term RV parking at travel plazas and hotel and motels within the city, and amending sections 42-318 and 42-339 to add short-term RV parking as a listed conditional use in the C-5 and C-7 zoning districts. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Mm -hmm. Staff has recently been contacted by several businesses, including the, the Quality Inn out at West Crawford and I-135 and by Mr. Augustine who owns the 24-7 convenience stores about um, their interest in establishing RV parks for short term or, or uh, overnight parking for I RVs as an accessory to their motel or travel plaza um, business. And we don't presently have a provision for allowing that. And so we discussed that with the planning commission and they agreed to initiate a text amendment and the, the text amendment would um, try to address in a limited way the, the desire of the market to provide short-term RV parking, um, which doesn't require the level of space to have a full-blown campground, which has a two-acre minimum and requires things like restrooms and showers and shelters for real long-term 
type campgrounds. And so this, this would be limited to being accessory to an existing business that operates 24 seven. And so it could be applicable to a travel center or to a hotel or motel that wanted to augment their business by developing an area for overnight RV parking and it would be done through a conditional use permit. And so um, rather than trying to draft a code that set out s over stay limits or number of stands or spaces you could have, the text amendment would give the Planning Commission the discretion to review plans on a case-by-case -case basis and establish uh, limits through a conditional use permit. Uh, the City of Abilene recently adopted a similar text amendment to accommodate a proposed RV park at North Buckeye and I-70. And you have this in your packet, but Mr. Wood has put up, this is just an aerial view of what was established just to the west of the 24-7 convenience store in Abilene. So it would not be uh, simply arranging RVs in a parking lot. We would, there would be a plan submitted and there would be services provided for for guests that were staying overnight. So, and it, you could have stays up to a week depending on, on the circumstances. Um, but we presently don't have a mechanism for getting something like this approved. And so, um, again, we have at least two business owners that are interested in moving forward with something like this. And so the Planning Commission uh, recommended six to zero that this text amendment be approved as drafted and presented. So your options this evening would be to approve the text amendment as drafted and presented on first reading. You could approve it subject to any additions or deletions or revisions um, that are supported by a majority of members. You could postpone consideration of this item if you'd like staff to provide you with additional information. Um, you could send it back to the Planning Commission if it, you think it needs to be reworked or you could decide to maintain the status quo and that no changes should be made and in that case a motion should be made that the attached ordinance not be approved. And with that, I'd be open to any questions that you have. Okay, we'll start to the left, Commissioner Hoppe. No. No. No, sir. Yeah. I guess my, my question is uh, the quality in on West Crawford. That's the unit on the west side of the highway? Yeah, it's on the west side of the highway. They have, um, they have kind of a recreation area with basketball goals and courts, but in the northwest corner and in the north of the motel, they have a fairly substantial empty space, and they were looking at laying out um, a number of RV spaces with hookups there to accommodate overnight travelers. Okay. And so if if it got if this were approved, then the business owners would have to develop a plan, show many how many stands they would have, how they would provide services and have that plan approved by the planning commission before they could move forward. And other facilities could follow and do the same thing. Yes. Yeah. So um, Mr. Augustine owns other properties in Salina in addition to the ones in Abilene and so he's expressed interest in that bringing that perhaps to Salina as well. So in the case of the hotel this I mean obviously if the person was driving through town and rented a room at the hotel they could park their RV there. Now anyway I'm assuming so this just gives that hotel owner the option of having a separate area for a non well they guest. could they could park their RV there if they were a guest of the motel but you can't just park an RV on a vacant commercial right. lot and camp there right so it's primarily regulating the overnight camping aspect yeah right. or it could if someone's visiting a relative in the hospital or something like that it may be more than that but it's designed for short term and to capitalize on the RV traffic that's going up and down the interstates. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the <coughs> public? Nothing online? All right, bring it back to the commission for action. Thank you. 
Mayor, I move the uh, commission approve the proposed text amendment as drafted and presented and approve ordinance number 22-11096 on first reading. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the proposed text amendment as drafted. Uh, ordinance number 22-11096 on first reading. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. All opposed? This will carries five nothing this will be presented second reading in two weeks i guess <laughs> or one week i'm gonna get I'm my weeks mixed up one week one week next week yeah okay the 21st is a holiday. local holiday correct okay thank you uh item 8.2 8.2 approve ordinance number 22-11098 annexing a 53.26 acre tract of land located east of Centennial Road between Schilling Road and Magnolia Road. Mr. Andrea. There's a area that's located between I-135 and the railroad tracks on either side of Magnolia Road that staff affectionately refers to as a donut hole because it's got city surrounding it on all four sides and the only part that's currently annexed is the area around the Menards store. And so the property that we're discussing here is located in the southwest corner of that donut hole and it's property that's currently landlocked with no frontage on an existing public street and has historically been cultivated farm ground. It was recently purchased by Storage Mart LLC and they have formed a limited liability company known as Building Kansas LLC and they're proposing to develop it into a residential subdivision to be platted and known as the Aeroplanes Addition. And they have reached agreement with the Salina Airport Authority to provide access um, through Airport, a street access through Airport Authority property that would have a physical connection to Centennial Road. And then they are also proposing to, dis to uh, construct a second means of access um, that would come off the end of Foxborough Drive as, as in a second emergency access in. And then as we look at the future of this area, they would be platting future street connections. So the hope is that at some point as this property develops, uh, then we would have streets continuing up to Magnolia Road so that we would have multiple points of access in the future. They have filed an application requesting that this be annexed in order to connect to city utilities and, and obtain full municipal services for their proposed residential subdivisions. They have submitted applications that are going to the Planning Commission for a change in zoning and a preliminary plat, but this annexation is, is moving ahead because they've also requested the formation of a rural housing incentive district and the property needs to be in the city limits for that to be considered. So we have um, agricultural land to the north and east. We have um, a area known as College Park down in this area here and we have the the uh, Schilling subdivision number five, which is part of the airport industrial area here. And so we have an abandoned rail right of way that runs through here and then Dry Creek is, <coughs> forms, forms the boundary there. Um, as part of infrastructure that was put in to support the Menards project, there is a 12 inch water main that runs along the north edge of the property right here. And there's also lines that serve the mini warehouse complex um, to the southwest. There may be a need to um, create a loop system with two sources of flow. We noted in our report that there was a large benefit district created for this area and there was a benefit fee assessed to this property right here of $145,000 for the water line improvements. Um, the plan is there is a interceptor sewer here and they can't connect directly to it but there is a gravity main with a manhole right at the southeast corner and that has been identified as the director of utilities as a possible sewer solution to have gravity service for this subdivision 
This is not part of any rural water district, so there's no franchise or district boundary issues. Um, there is a natural gas line that was put in on Magnolia Road as part of the Menards project. And there, there's also natural gas to the uh, west and to the south. The other thing we would note is that running right parallel to Foxborough Drive, there's a high pressure gas pipeline that runs through here and that, that will affect the future layout of the subdivision plat. Um, the uh, Centennial Road was reconstructed to city standards in 1995 as part of a KDOT project. So that would be their, their direct access perimeter street for the subdivision would be Centennial Road. Um, upon annexation, the City of Salina Fire Department and Police Department would be providing police and fire protection. And so the potential benefits of annexing this area would be additional city property tax, city sales tax, and franchise taxes, collection of the benefit fee for the water line uh, that was installed to serve future development. This project's also directly supportive of the housing needs that have been identified in our housing study update. The comprehensive plan shows this as being in the urban service area and suitable for a suburban residential development. And if this is annexed, the property would be subject to the city's mill levy. Um, as with other subdivisions, the city would have maintenance responsibility for public streets and utility lines. So this would be presented to you for consideration on first reading and your options this evening would be to uh, approve an ordinance on first reading annexing this 53 acre tract into the city. Um, your other option would be to postpone consideration this evening if you would like staff or the applicant to provide you with additional information or you could decline to approve the annexation ordinance which would leave this property outside the city limits. So if this is approved this evening on first reading, sec second reading would occur next Monday on the 14th, and that would allow the commission to consider a request for RHID financing uh, for, this, for housing development on this property. We do have representatives of Building Kansas LLC present this evening if you have specific questions for them about the project, but I'd be open to any questions you have or if you want to see the map again. Any questions, Mr. Andrew? With the applicant, I'm not sure who I should be looking at. <laughs> I'd like to come forward. Pace to go Thank around. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of interesting being on this side of the podium right. uh, <laughs> after about four or five years of not being here. So I appreciate that. Um, I am Gary Hobby. I represent the, the project administration for Building Kansas LLC. When it was brought to me, the, the new uh, annexation into the properties or to the city, it uh, kind of concerned me of where the location would be. But after we start talking and start looking at the project area, uh, I feel like this is more of an infill project that's been pushed at us for multiple years to see if we could get something done. Uh, I think Dean has been graciously uh, given us some ideas and thoughts about our preliminary plat and our zoning process, we're moving forward with that once you have approved this annexation today. We're excited about the idea of being able to bring a different type of model to you for housing within our community. And as Ms. Driscoll mentioned earlier today, we need about uh, 375 new houses a year for the next three to five years. And we hope to play, uh, be a major player in that. I have with me today uh, one of the principal owners of Building Kansas LLC, Lance Cochran. He'd like to speak as well. Mr. Cochran. And I'm also here to answer questions. I, I think Gary kind of hit on it. Basically, this is a, an infill project I, in, in my mind and the fact that we're, we're already going, the city's already surrounded this. Um, I just want you guys to know that we have already done this in Lindsburg. We've had a good experience with it, had really great luck with the RHID. We're going great guns over there. We're far ahead of schedule as far as building. We've got people strongly interested over there. We've, I've always wanted to do this project in Salina. It just worked out to go in Lindsburg first. We had such great success over there that we decided to give it another shot over here. Um, if we get the RHID and possibly the MIH, MIH grants, I think we're gonna hit a price point of 234.9, which is a much needed price point for Salina. We can build up to 318 units at that price. 
Um, we're, we're looking at a couple of other grants. If we can get the base grant and possibly get tax credits, we may be able to get them down to 199 apiece. Um, we're talking 1,550 square feet, three bedroom, three bath, luxury finishes, granite countertops, um, excellent properties. I mean, you guys, I would welcome you to come over to look at our properties in Lindsburg. I think, you know, th they're pretty impressive. And so, um, I, the, the main goal here is, is to get this started and get housing in Salina. Um, if you think about it at 2349 with 318 units, that's 75 to 100 million in additional tax base for the city of Salina. I couldn't be prouder than having the opportunity to do this and yet very scared, but here I am. So, um, <laughs> any questions? I did tour your facility or your properties over in Lindsburg and you had, I believe, two different floor plans. Is that what you plan on doing here also? Um, we actually may do up to three. Okay. Right now we have the three bedroom, three bath. We've got they're called the Lear and the Citation, but basically the plan was to have a young family set with all the bedrooms upstairs and kind of a living area on the basement, on the first floor. The, one, the second plan is for kind of the older generation, maybe there's a, there's a primary bedroom and then a secondary bedroom on the first floor, and then there's an area with like a really nice space on the second floor plus another, what, what could be a master bedroom, but realistically is hopefully the idea is that when there's a, an elderly couple or single lives there, when their kids come to visit, they can be upstairs. I think there's been some strong interest in also a two bedroom, two bath. Uh, so we would basically take the top off of that, still two bedroom, two bath, two car garage. Again, still doing luxury finishes. They'll have granite countertops. If you come over and look, it's not shabbily put together. They're very nice. And these will be on a slab and two, and two car garage. Yes, okay. absolutely. Cool. Question, any other questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I did have one question. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, driven by there, uh, it's pretty low property. I, is this floodplain area? It is not. It's not. There, there's a small portion on the very east edge that's in the floodway that, as a matter of fact, it will, be not, will not bother any of our construction project at all. Okay. But we'll make sure we take care of any issues that come up. Or and I'm assuming, based on your Lindsburg project, it's pretty much north-south straight streets? Actually, no. no. We're, pl we're planning on putting in drives and there, we're, that's kind of subject to some changes right now yeah. but we hope to have them one way in one way out I live on a one way in one way out street and I think it's safer for children so I'm hoping to avoid as many open streets as possible hmm. okay thank you okay thanks guys any questions comments from the public anyone online well, we bring this back to the Commission for Action. Mayor, I move that we approve Ordinance Number 2211098 on first reading, act annexing a 53-acre tract into the city. I'll uh, second that. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's moved and seconded to approve Ordinance Number 22-11098. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five nothing. Is there any other business? Uh, Mayor, we had an interesting letter from the public. I think it came to all uh, to our city commission email that suggested that we move the public forum to the end of the agenda, that it better suits uh, items scheduled for hearing and people from out of town that have come to our community to uh, um, get their business done promptly after it's been scheduled probably for some amount of time. And although I think it's very important we hear the public, uh, I think we've got some liberty there to schedule it into the uh, agenda where we want to. So uh, I'd like to hear the other commissioner's thoughts about that, whether that would make some sense to move that farther down into our agenda. Seems like a reasonable request to me. I mean, if you're, especially if you're looking at traveling, if you're, you have to be here to take care of your business, whether you're developer, et cetera, and they're basically, um, depending on how long the public forums go, it, it would definitely make sense to push it to the back because it's, I think, a safe assumption that most folks that are partaking in it don't have a commute to get home. And I would note that the writer, and I've agreed with this for some time, uh, mentioned that there are, we've had some commentary that we should start our meetings later in the daytime. Uh, if the, the public forum were a little later, that would accommodate maybe that five o'clock time that people were looking for to uh, uh, 
to come in and be able to make a comment that would it would be a little later in the entire meeting. That's something that I thought would be an advantage to to moving that to the end that uh, people that work don't get off till five o'clock or five thirty. They could come and put in their their comment. But uh, I I would like to postpone doing this any action on this until this ordinance initiative is resolved so it does not appear that we are pushing those people out the door well that i guess you know looking at it from the devil's advocate perspective if we have a very routine business handling stuff that sometimes takes us until nine o'clock at night we're going to ask citizens who want to come up here and speak for three minutes to wait till 9.15 at night before they get a chance to speak. And I think that might be construed as stifling public comment more so than, than uh, the other way, other way around. I, I, I just, yep, assuming we keep the, I remember not to do this with this hand, but assuming we uh, keep the, the, the Zoom access, certainly if, if someone wants to participate, uh, from home and they know they only want to say three minutes, they could certainly put their Zoom on, you know, mute it, do housework or whatever they want to do, you know, play free cell on the computer. And when that time comes, you know, raise their hand and, and, and comment. I'm, I'm just a little hesitant, you know, particularly in the, in the wintertime, having someone sit out here till 8 o'clock at night when it's 15 degrees and dark to... Well, I would Say add, add into that that we do have the advantage of Zoom now, but people can also, since th their comments wouldn't have been scheduled, they could come to another meeting and they can always email us uh, and write us letters as well. So uh, to, if it was an inconveniently long meeting, I think they, they have alternatives to just speak at another meeting. Or, or could it be moved somewhere in the middle? you know, get the developmental business moved up the top and uh, have the public forum somewhere in the middle there. If I was, if you're going to move it, you just move it to the end. I don't see where moving it to the middle is uh, beneficial. <laughs> um, no, I, I guess I'd look at staff as to if, if we decide to, is this something we need to take to vote? How do we, how do we handle this as just a, an agenda? <clears throat> you have adopted rules of procedure okay. and have done a little bit of checking. That's what I was going to ask. In anticipation of this question. So we have adopted rules of procedure, and rule number two is the agenda, and it, it spells out the order that it's currently in. So I think there, we could prepare an action for you that could you know, place that in whatever alternate order you would like. Having said that, any given meeting, you can amend that agenda. So if you end up with... Uh, you know, a concern that the meeting's going to run long or, or some unique circumstance that you would want to place it somewhere else on the agenda. You could amend it for that individual um, meeting, but we would need to amend the rules of procedure to kind of set the predetermined order. And, and we have in certain circumstances where we knew consultants <coughs> were here from Kansas City move their item on the agenda up just to get them on the road, you know, going back home uh, earlier in the evening. And... I would think that would be uh, still a safe way to, to operate. Uh, how, d from a logistic standpoint, does if public comment were going for an excessive period of time, uh, does it pose any legal or perceived problems if it's split, cut off, and then continued at the end of the meeting? Consideration that you might expect is that we do handle that as a open public forum, and uh, as long as everyone that wished to speak had an opportunity in a single meeting, I think you satisfied your legal obligation. Because I think the argument from people who may be hourly workers or, or don't have much time between work and their family uh, to ask them to give up five, now four hours of their evening to make their three-minute comment uh, might be just as oppressive as having them come, you know, at, at four o'clock. 
I think what I'm hearing is uh, to try to have some flexibility. Yeah, that yeah. is it. <laughs> yeah, that's not, <laughs> not in government. That's, I, I may have introduced that concept. Yeah. I, I think I think you. It's going to be necessary for you by rules of, of your rules of procedure to kind of set the predetermined order, and your flexibility then would be on a case by case, meeting by meeting basis. You could amend that order, but it, we we need a starting point. Well, in well, my opinion, I guess I'm saying yeah. it should be at the end, and let's try it. Let's let's yeah. give it six months or a year and uh, and certainly what you said we're about worrying about somebody being here until for four hours we if we were aware of that whatever that issue was we could move it the the form back to the beginning of the agenda to alleviate that so there's flexibility aspect well since the cats are already out the bag I, I might suggest we just uh, wait to see what comments we get over the next three weeks <laughs> Can we make a public comment now? Uh, in just a second, if, if commissioners have any more. Yeah, and if we're going to look at it, uh, and, and Ms. Commissioner Longbine says he'd like to wait after the ordinance. Well, we're not discussing the ordinance up here, and there's always going to be something. <laughs> so I would say if we're going to bring it before the commission uh, for discussion, there's, I don't see why we wait for march or whatever well I, I may be putting words in your mouth but to avoid the perception that we're trying to stifle the democratic process because th uh, those would be my words but you can use your own words <laughs> yeah and, and i think uh that needs to be known in the general public like ben wants to have a comment other others have a right to weigh in on it Well, I, I, know, I, I don't know how the vote would go. For that right now. <laughs> I agree with Commissioner Opic. I don't see the the sense in waiting at it as long as we recognize we have the ability to amend the agenda in any meeting. So, um, idea I'd like to try. Well, and it's not that often that we spend that much time. I mean, an excessive amount of time, uh, and sometimes you know we need to let that steam be released. I mean, it is our job to listen. Yeah. And I, I just see making somebody wait till 7, 8 o'clock at night is going to be an undue burden. Well, I, one of my other feelings about uh, having it at the, at the front of the meeting is there can be a lot of negativity that kind of sets a negative tone. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> good, good point. I was, yeah, that was something I was going to articulate is, you know, it's not that we're trying to prioritize one group of citizens over another, but at the end of the day, what we have is we have a group of people here who are conducting business, that business that's potentially growing our city, increasing tax revenue, et cetera. And then we have a group of folks that, you know, just have some things they want to, I like the, the analogy of like releasing pressure, kind of like a pressure relief valve off a water heater, for instance. Mm -hmm. And we need that. And it's, you know, I think it's a good thing to have. But maybe sometimes when that happens at the beginning of the meeting and we have an audience of developers and business owners or people that want to invest in our community, and then they get, we just kind of air our dirty laundry, essentially in front of people that are looking to put money into our, our city. And maybe that's unavoidable, but maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to mitigate it or de-emphasize it. Well, if we have dirty laundry, we need to find a way to wash it. I mean, it's, well, I it's that, but <laughs> we're not throwing out the washing machine. <laughs> not everybody's. Right. Well, I would hope know. those developers have done their due diligence and looked <laughs> at what our community really is. I, and I, believe, I understand both sides of the I'm discussion. I'm just hoping I, minds don't get changed during that process, mm -hmm. potentially, or you know, reconsidering investing. And, and again, I'm just spitballing and, and shooting from the hip at this point, but that's just kind of my. And the comments we hear here are no different from the comments you'd read on any newspaper in any city in the United States or turn on any TV channel. It's understood. Same comments. 
I guess we need to see if we have enough consensus to ask staff to bring us a an am yeah, in fact, amendment. I, procedurally, I think it would be helpful on this issue and I think we maybe we turn over a new leaf that a motion, a second with respect to amending it as well as the date that you uh, want it returned back to you for your consideration. How many, that, how long do you need to put something together? Uh, if you tell me what you want the order to be, it, it's not that hard of an amendment, but then it becomes a question of, you know, uh, how much public notice you want out in the community. Um, and and I do think at some point, um, well, maybe when, after you make the motion, it's probably the best time for public comment this see. evening then. Do, I mean, we could make it two or three weeks from now to give public comment to come forward, I guess. Um, anybody, do I hear, see any? Um, do we have a meeting on the 21st? We do not. Uh, it's not. Uh, so President's we'll Day. Staff could accomplish this by the 28th? We could. Mm -hmm. I'd be okay with that. You want to make the motion? You want me to? Can I throw another suggestion out there no. before we can go? <clears throat> Since everybody has suggestions. <laughs> Um, well, can I come forward? I'm going to ask the city to, it, do, if should that be held till after the motion, or, or we should allow it. In that this is not an item that's on the agenda right now. My feeling is we would take that vote. We take that comment when we see the revised resolution. I'll answer your question, but also. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the receipt of comments would probably be best if you have a motion before you uh, yet today. The other aspect is, speaking of your rules of procedure, and I, I'm not, I don't know what sort of motion you might be considering. Mm -hmm. But in order for you to consider a matter on this evening's agenda that is not presently on your agenda, requires a four-member uh, four vote. Uh, so the first step would be, if, if there is, is to be a substantive matter considered uh, and or a substantive change, uh, then the first step would be to determine whether or not you wish to consider that this evening, and that's what takes the four-member vote. Um, simply placing a matter for discussion on a future agenda uh, is strictly a majority vote. So uh, not knowing exactly what motion uh, anyone might have in mind, I just point that out, uh, hopefully, to help you chart the course here today. Well, if I could take a stab at it, then, Mayor, I'd move that we place on the next uh, agenda a discussion item for amending the rules and procedures that, as to the order of agenda items. Is there a second? I would second that, yes. Okay, so it's been moved. And clarification, the 14th would be the next agenda. The holiday would be the 21st, and so just want to make sure you whether you intended the 14th or the 28th. And this is just for discussion is the way he no, made it. He didn't no, ask for. We haven't directed you to, to do yeah. it yet. And <laughs> yeah. now we have the Sorry to be the one that's confused. I mean, you are all on the same page. Yeah. And yeah. we are in the. Because I, I did bring up my motion might have been right. different. So and, okay. and this is discussion on that motion. Discussion and, on that topic. I mean, that topic. Well, you did make a motion to have it added to the next agenda. Mm -hmm. Right. I would just ask the city clerk or the city manager how long the agenda is on the 14th particularly for any of and then please don't take this the wrong <laughs> way any of you who spouses think that you they're being taken out to dinner after their meeting next <laughs> week. <laughs> actually i have a big reveal point. to go um, <laughs> well there's an there is another consideration and that is county planning commission meetings on occasion start at 7 p.m after our meeting if you can take me a little bit to that to it, that's but. tonight so we should be good next okay. week so, so as long as you as long as we can make the decision in less than an hour <laughs> it should be <laughs> um so the 14th agenda 
Um, board appointments, engineering contract, an easement, some proclamations. It's not, well, I say it's not too bad, but it depends on when you want to go to dinner. Um, right. <laughs> the Ed Sisson comment to that plus this, yeah, you're probably getting around 6 o'clock or so, if, if not later. Yeah, if you get out by 6 and you're on your own. Yeah, okay. But, and that, <laughs> okay, so there is a motion on the... On the on the floor right now we can have public I'm sorry. I will look at the, my other two commissioners there and if they feel more comfortable with the 28th I just think this is something we ought to try so uh, the exact process of getting there doesn't the timeline of it doesn't matter to me so I think I would be in favor of moving to the 28th just to, you know I, I don't think this is something that has to be done states Inconsequential to me. It's, it's only one meeting <laughs> in between. That's, that's oh. true. <laughs> I, so that would, but I do think it is something we need to address. Yeah, so the uh, second of the motion would be an agreement to switch yes, to the 28th. Yeah. Okay. We can now have public comment on the motion. Uh, uh, certainly. Well, no, actually, I take that back. This is just a motion. Well, to add it to the next agenda. So that's the 28th. But we'll still take. Come on up to the podium, yeah, because yeah, he might want to do something on the 28th. Yeah. <laughs> might start this conversation all over. I'll, 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 I'll spend those 55 minutes. Yeah, maybe I'll minutes. throw a wrench in this whole thing. As a plumber, I can do that. Okay, Ben <laughs> Winhold Salina, you were talking about being flexible. You were talking about the middle. You were talking, uh, Mr. Hoffick, about the end. What if you put a time of 5.30 or around? Because this way you're going to get your people that work 8 to 5. They're going to know that they're going to need to get their butts down here uh, for the city commission to be able to make themselves known at 5.30 and not interfere with their work schedule, basically. And Mr. Mayor, you're really good at keeping time going, you know. So, and I, I can't say you can do it right at 5.30 because of the way your agenda items go. But that that area, 5.30 or a little after, say, okay, now it's time for the open, open comments. And just putting it, it's not in the middle of the meeting. Of course, now if your meetings are short, it would be at the end. But it's still that time period, basically. And if your meetings are, you know, have nothing on your agenda and you start at 4 and you're done at 5, it'll have to be at the end. That's certainly another consideration for... That's something, we can, that's something we can discuss on the 20th. Yeah, we can discuss that on the 20th. A lot of ideas. <laughs> Good idea. Great. Gave us, gave us something to think about. So. All right. We make, yeah. So. All right. Uh, do we need the motion repeated? Everyone comfortable? This is to add to the agenda for the 28th discussion of placement of Citizens Forum on our agenda. Okay. All Revision in favor? of the rules and regulations. Uh, as, Thank you. As a as addresses the agenda and its order yeah you right. summarize it for me. okay thank you <laughs> all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed the motion carries five nothing uh any other other business okay entertain a motion to adjourn mayor so i make a motion we adjourn second okay any uh objection we are adjourned thank you